Hello, my name is Buck Lewis, and I'm in Nashville, Tennessee today, March 18th, 2006, to interview of the Fellows of the Tennessee Bar Foundation and the Supreme Court Historical Society. Uh, before we totally start this interview, let me say that I've not been a very special person to me, and he's president-elect of the Tennessee Bar, and, and I, I want to tell you how much I appreciate your coming all the way from Memphis uh, to do this on a Saturday morning. Well, thank you, Judge, and uh, our friendship has been a, uh, a, a wonderful thing. Uh, for me. Um, I can see, though, that uh, you're not going to answer my questions. You're going to say whatever you feel like saying. I was trying to uh, avoid that because not many people really know every order My uh, real name is Francis Ferdinand Drawoda III, and so you can see why I have not used it that way. But the truth of the matter is, I thought that my dad had changed our name legally because he did go down to the courthouse when I was a young boy and told me he had gotten it changed. So uh, a few years ago, I checked because I was getting some grief from my wife about all of these orders and opinions. It was D-R-W-T-A. Uh, it's a Slavic name from Czechoslovakia, and you couldn't really pronounce it. So he added an O. But I was under the impression, since he was Frank F., that I was Frank F. So uh, now the world knows, and uh, thank you so much for that first question. Well, and my grandfather made my father name me George Talbert Lewis III, and my father always said that I sounded like worn-out British royalty, so I know how you feel. <laughs> Um, well, you talked about the spelling of your name. Have there been funny stories over the year about people mispronouncing even the D-R-O-W-O-T-A? I, I mean, I find people have a lot of trouble with it. I find people, I have a lot of trouble with it. I mean, uh, people will say, now, how do you pronounce your name? And, and I struggle with it. And it's certainly difficult when you're running in a contested race. Uh, particularly like in 1980 when you're running against somebody named Brown. Uh, yeah. but, uh, well, on the other hand, I guess it makes it a little more easy to remember. Yeah. I think in, in uh, East Tennessee, for some, somehow some of my materials had an 
ended with an O, and so I was Drowoto, and so, and being short, they assumed I was Oriental, but uh, apparently uh, it didn't help or hurt. <laughs> well, as long as they pull the right lever, that's all you all that years. And that stayed the same throughout his career? Yes, it certainly okay. did. He grew up, he was born in London, England. He grew up an Episcopalian, but uh, when he was at the Citadel, changed because my mother was a member of the Christian Church uh, in South Carolina. So women kind of tend to change your lives. Um, I joined the Episcopal Church when I married my wife, Melinda. Um, and I always found that the difference between Presbyterians and the Episcopal Church was that the Episcopalians concentrated much more on grace. So I was happy to make that change. <laughs> <laughs> now, what was your father's full name? Well, he was, his full name, he was, he was Francis Ferdinand Drewoda Jr. And your mother's full name? Vivian Rose Russell right. Drewoda. And, and I know they stayed married many, many years. How long was 71 years. Mother lived to be, uh, Dad died when he was 94, and they had just celebrated their, uh, well, they had celebrated their 71st and were about to celebrate their uh, uh, 72nd. And, uh, and then Mother lived to be over 100, so. She lived to be 101, didn't she? Well, close to it, close to it. Did she ever go on Willard Scott? <laughs> <laughs> no, but she saw our, uh, our local, uh, Weatherman put her on when she was a hundred. That's great. Is longevity uh, all across your family? Not necessarily. No, on my father's side, it really wasn't. He he lived longer than any member of his family, and and uh, I think mother's mother and father lived into their early nineties. So, if I don't mess up on the ski slope somewhere, I hope to uh, have many more fun years in retirement. Well, we're going to talk a lot about that in just a little while. Well, we can leave that <laughs> off if you'd like. <laughs> now, tell me your sister's full name. Uh, Claire Ann Drewoda Carpenter. She uh, married a lawyer, and that probably had a lot to do with why I ended up, you know, going into law. Is he the carpenter of Good Pasture Carpenter and Woods? Right. I uh -huh. see. Okay. Is she still alive? Yes, very much so. She is... Right. I'm uh, 67, so she is 77, and I keep reminding her that she's no longer a young woman. Is she still living in Nashville? Yes. Uh -huh. Is her she, husband still alive? Yes, very much so. And she has uh, a son, Bill Carpenter the third, who is a lawyer and practices, was with Waller Lanston, but is now with LifePoint. Great. Are there other lawyers in the family? No, that's it. That's okay. it. Um, what about your grandparents? My grandfather on my dad's side uh, had an interesting story in that he was born in, in Vienna, Austria. 
uh, when he was about 19, he moved to London and uh, met my grandmother, who was born and raised in London. And they got married and, and had two sons, Dad being the oldest. And uh, so Dad went to public schools in London and had gotten a scholarship to Eton, which was a very fine uh, school there. And World War I broke out. And uh, the fact that he was from Austria, he was going to have to either go back to Austria or to the U.S. And uh, he, he was not allowed to stay in England, even though his wife and children were all born there. So the family uh, caught a boat and, and the St. Paul and went to, uh, uh, to uh, New York City, Statue of Liberty. He has some just great stories about that point in time in his life. Mm -hmm. Was he, and he, he was a United States citizen? Not at that point in time. Right, did Late, he go through Ellis Island? Yes, very much so. And, uh, and then he ended up in Charleston, South Carolina on King Street, which is one of your downtown streets, and had a mom and pop kind of fish market. And uh, they lived upstairs and uh, had the fish market downstairs. And I thought as a kid, it was just the greatest place to go visit because the, all, all the candy and Cokes and stuff on that first floor were free, <laughs> I thought. <laughs> and uh, so they, they, they were quite a couple. And, and he was still very British and they would close the store so he could have his afternoon tea. And uh, uh, so I learned a lot from them, and as Dad did. And, and Dad went to high school there and then went to the Citadel, and then uh, after the Citadel went into the ministry. Well, I know you enjoy eating seafood. Is that where that came from? That's where that came from. Is that really where it came from? Okay. <laughs> did they have a lot of children? No, they, he, he had one brother. Okay. And he lived in Charleston. And, and was raised in Charleston, died in Charleston, and he had two girls. And so uh, my son is the last one with the name Drowoda, but he has had a, a little son that he, we named our son Frank Russell. Uh, we weren't gonna burden him with the Francis <laughs> with Ferdinand, the Ferdinand and particularly make a fourth out of him. So uh, he was, went by the name of Frank and his son, who is Frank Russell, goes by Russell. So it seems to all be working out. Your father was a much beloved uh, man of faith here in Nashville for so many years. Was there anybody else in the family that uh, was a clergyman? No, there really wasn't. Uh, uh, his, my mother's father was an elder in the Christian church in Russellville, Kentucky. He was a Russell from Russellville. It was a very small little town. And, uh, and I think mother's background and her father's influence had a lot to do with Dad going into the ministry. And he was, as you said, uh, we were here, we were very fortunate. He had the church here in Nashville for over 30 years. So his ministry was over 50 years. And, uh, but to be in one place 30 years was is kind of unusual. Yeah, most, most PKs, preacher's kids, have to live a lot of different places. A lot of places, so I was very, very fortunate. Okay. Um, was your father involved in political and community activities as you have been your whole life? Very involved in community activities, uh, n not very involved politically at all. He, he never preached politics from the pulpit, and, uh, and you really never knew how he vote, voted. Uh, he, would, he, he didn't claim one party or the other. He just voted for the person. So Usually, he was at least politically correct to the extent he didn't tell his church how he was voting. Right, right. And, and he claimed he usually canceled out mother's vote. So I don't know what that meant, but uh, well, I was she, was, she was a, a yellow dog Democrat. I was going to ask if she was politically involved. <laughs> yes, she, from being from South Carolina, she was very much a Democrat. All right. Did you get your Democratic leanings from her or... Have you gone back? You've always been a Democrat, as far as I know. Well, you know, truth of the matter is I was never very political. Uh, in, in law school, I remember Frank Gorell got a group of law students to be law students for Mayor Briley, but that was a nonpartisan race. And uh, I guess Frank Gorell got me as involved in the Democratic Party as, as anyone. Let's talk a little bit about what it was like to grow up here. Um, did y'all live in the parsonage? 
Well, it's interesting. He, he had a, a beautiful church in Mayfield, Kentucky, a large church about between 1,200 and 1,500 members. The church was paid for, well-established church. And I don't know how they talked him into coming to Nashville to start up a church. They had like 52 members, and they started meeting in, in Woodmont School, which was a little school on Estes in Nashville. And uh, so when we moved to Nashville, they had built... They hadn't built, they had bought a large building at the corner of Hillsborough and Woodmont. So that's where Woodmont Christian Church uh, started. But this was a, a, a big uh, colonial building that had the six columns, and we lived in half of the building, and the church was in the other half. So it was, it was very unusual for the first three to four years. Mother wasn't allowed to cook pot roast on Sundays because everybody in the church would then want to come and have pot roast. with us. Well, it's and, not uh, quite like being in the White House, but a similar loss of privacy. <laughs> right. <laughs> Big time loss of privacy. But, uh, and then I, I guess when I was about eight years old, we moved uh, to a parsonage. So I did grow up in a parsonage. How long did you live in that parsonage? Gosh, I, you know, I went to, uh, I, I stayed in the parsonage even through law school simply because it was uh, cheaper living at home. And uh, so I guess until uh, 1965 when Claire and I got married uh, she didn't want to live in the parsonage so uh, we she's we, unreasonable like that very, very unreasonable she said she thought we ought to have an apartment you know so we, we went that route well was it difficult to be a young person and be coming and going I didn't have my first drink until I was in the Navy uh, because none of my friends drank and you didn't drink in the parsonage. And uh, so that phase of it, you might say, was sheltered. But uh, I think all of the little women, in the, little old women as I used to call them in the church, thought that I was going to be a preacher. And uh, because on youth Sundays, I would always be the one to deliver the sermon and things like that. So I think the real thought was, little Frankie is going to be a minister. And so they were very disappointed when I went into the law. But as I told my dad, I, I never felt the call. And that is one profession where I think you really need to have the call to devote yourself to that. But I've always looked upon uh, the law as, as kind of my ministry. I think lawyers like yourself and others in Tennessee who give of themselves to pro bono and, and, and so many outside activities. I think, I think uh, they are ministers. Let's go back to this preaching for just a minute. How often did you preach? Well, just on Youth Sundays, and fortunately that was just once a year. Once a year, okay. Yes, yes. Did you have a favorite sermon or a favorite Bible verse? <laughs> he is really getting on me, isn't he? Uh, actually, no. I, I would just tell uh, things that were going on in my life at that time. And, and obviously, have, having a preacher for the Father, he kind of helped me with those sermons. So uh, He helped they, you with your homework. Yeah, so they probably sounded a little bit like, like him. That's why all the little ladies thought I would do so good. But you did certainly, you were certainly a person of strong faith even as an adolescent. Right, and, and Claire and I, when we got married, I think one of the first things we did were, were sponsors of the youth group there at church, and we've taught Sunday school, and we've both served on, on the board as deacons and myself as an elder. So, no, the church is very much a part of our life, and it still is. I mean, in retirement, that's one of the main things that, that I've been doing that and the YMCA and, and uh, trying to help with some other law-related issues also. You played a little football too, didn't you? 
th that was a fun part of, of my life, uh, particularly in high school. And uh, uh, we won the state championship, and, and we're having our 50th high school reunion uh, in about a month. And so we've got uh, some great T-shirts made up. The older we were, the better. The, let's see, the older we get, the better we were. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, our team went undefeated, but now I think we, we kind of claim the national championship. <laughs> <laughs> well, your old friend Tommy Frist tells me that, uh, that now you claim to have been the quarterback, even though well, he was the quarterback. you know, when you're campaigning, people relate more to the quarterback. They think the quarterback is smarter, even though he doesn't have to necessarily be. And Tommy certainly wasn't. But uh, <laughs> that was a joke. He's done fairly well. Uh, but we, we had a good group of friends, and, and we've all stayed close friends. And, and Tommy and, and, and Macroff and Phil Williams and some of those went on to Vanderbilt. And I did not go out for football uh, my freshman year. And they all did and had such fun with it. So the spring practice of my freshman year, I went out and was fortunate and got a scholarship for my sophomore year and had a fun time trying that at Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt never has been an SEC power, so you could be a 155, 160-pound halfback back in the, in the late 50s and, and survive. Uh, but actually, I didn't survive. I got a serious knee injury, and so my, I quit at the end of my sophomore year. But football was a big part of my life. Let's go back to high school. Where'd you go to high school? Montgomery Bell Academy, which was is, it it was founded back in the right around the Civil War, and uh, when we went back in the fifties, truthfully, it wasn't a very good school. Uh, it uh, academically, I don't think any of us would have probably gotten in right now, but they've got a, a great school now, and I'm very involved with it on on that school's board, as are most of my friends, and so we. Uh, we have a good time with it, and I go back almost every Friday night. If it's a home game, you can see me in the stands uh, watching the football. And even though it sounds like you lied about it during your political campaigns, you played halfback. Is that right? Right. right. And, and I understand that Tommy Frist not only was a friend of yours in high school, but actually goes back to the second or third grade. Is that right? Right. Right. And, and we, we played football together at, at Woodmont School. They had a sixth grade team and a seventh and eighth grade team and we had a man named coach Catnini who was our grammar school coach and he went on to be the head coach at Father Ryan High School, the Catholic high school here, and had just a tremendous career. So we feel blessed having been coached by him and then later a man named Tommy Owen who just taught you so many lessons of life uh, on the football field and, and in summer practices and I think truthfully we gained more from Tommy Owen than perhaps any teacher we had at NBA. Did you play from the ninth through the 12th grades or seventh through the 12th grades? Well, we were at Woodmont in the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade and I then see. moved over to NBA. And, and uh, we, no, we played varsity ball just sophomore, junior, and senior years. And NBA during that period of time, they were having great teams. They, I think my junior year they came in second in the state and my senior year we came in first and then after I graduated they came in third so they were always in the running and back in those days public and private uh, all competed together and you had no divisions of 5A, 4A and so when you won the state championship you had beaten the best throughout the state. Was the high school segregated? Uh, no, not it, this was an all-boys school, and there were no African Americans at that time. Uh, now, obviously, yes. Uh, I, I, when I say obviously, I, I guess the first African Americans came in about the 70s. Well, the reason I ask is movies such as Remember the Titans and, mm -hmm. and other movies have talked about how that for, for young men in the South, a lot of times the, the way that they really develop friendships with men of other races was through sports. Did, was right. that true of you as well? Not really, and it wasn't true. It, it's interesting. My dad was quite an athlete, and uh, and and back in when when he was in high school, and so I guess we're talking about around the 1920s. Uh, they literally had a national football championship. They worked their way through 
South Carolina region and then the, the, the southern region and ended up going by boat to Peabody, Massachusetts to play Peabody for the national championship. And Peabody had African Americans on their football team and Charleston, South Carolina High School did not. And so Dad said the banquet before the game, the, the mayor of Charleston would not attend because they were African Americans. And uh, so Dad got a, a view of the South at that being from England, you know, he, he wasn't aware of all of that. Uh, but no, when I was, when I was in, in, in high school, we still, uh, Pearl High School was still the predominantly powerhouse in, in the black community. Was that when you got your other nickname, when you were halfback? I'm not sure what you're referring to, but I had many it starts nicknames. starts with an S. Yeah, yeah, I was. Ends I, in an R. Yeah, I was Skeeter back in those days. And it's so funny, with our reunion, we call people up to make sure they're coming back. And uh, I'll say, I don't say this is Frank because they don't know who Frank is. So I say, <laughs> this is Frankie. And, and that they pause a little bit, and then I'll say Skeeter, and then they immediately know. It's funny in those days how you went by nicknames, but uh, you don't hear that quite as much these days. What was your nickname? Buck. Good, good <laughs> name. It kind of stuck, didn't it? <laughs> I don't hear a lot of people calling you George. No, it, it was just too confusing with Dad being a lawyer when I got home. I had to have something for people to distinguish us by. And since he wasn't named Ferdinand, that's the best thing we could come <laughs> up with. Um, well, did you, did you date throughout high school? Did, did you meet Claire during high school? No, Cl Claire is uh, seven years younger than I am. So when I was in high school, she was in grammar school somewhere. Uh, and I had got, got, gone through Vanderbilt and two years of the Navy, and then I was in law school when I met her, and uh, she, I guess we met, I, like I said, I was, I guess, 25 at the time, and she was just graduating from high school. So uh, uh, two years after we met, we got married. I was 27 and she was 20, and she was at Wellesley at the time, which is right outside of Boston, but she ended up finishing up at her last two years at Vanderbilt. What's her full name? Uh, Helen Claire Hooper Drawota. She was a Hooper from Nashville. And how exactly did you meet? <laughs> we met at a day camp, and I was kind of her boss, and I thought this is a very attractive, uh, she wasn't a camper now, she was one of the <laughs> junior counselors. I wouldn't date campers, and, uh, and so we, we met and dated that summer, and, uh, and then the next summer, and the following summer got married. So How'd that go over at the Christian church? It went over well. It went over well. She, believe it or not, she was a member of the Christian church, Vine Street. There are really only three Christian churches in Nashville, Eastwood, Vine Street, and Woodmon. And so, so she didn't have to uh, do a whole, whole lot of different studying to become a member of the church. She, in fact, had to introduce my father at a Harpeth Hall gathering once. And like I said, there was so much difference. I didn't know her and she didn't know me. And she spent hours saying, trying to pronounce the name Drawoda, you know, so she wouldn't <laughs> mess it up. And now she is one. <laughs> well, she certainly is a, a fine lady and much beloved in, in her own right. W did she develop her interest in politics and government through you or did she have it when you met her? I think she had it when, when we met. And, yeah. and which political persuasion was she when you met? Well, we were still the same political party. You must remember back in the 60s in Davidson everybody County, was everybody was a Democrat. Yeah. Um, now, did you go in the Navy before college or after no, college? No, af after college. I was an NROTC, and so I spent two years on the aircraft carrier Shangri-La, and we spent most of our time in the Mediterranean. And... Uh, this was, you know, between the Korean War and the Vietnam War, so I, I missed both of those. And it's interesting being on an aircraft carrier. Uh, the pilots really would have preferred to be at war at the time because they practiced all the time bombing runs and various missions, and that's what you spent all your time training for. And so uh, from 60 to 62 was a very dull existence for some of those. I was obviously delighted that we were in the Mediterranean, 
kind of doing a people-to-people -people program and trying to be goodwill ambassadors. And as a, a junior officer, when we would go into various ports, they would have the junior officers take the consul, various consuls' uh, children out. And so that, that was interesting, and we met a lot of uh, interesting people along the way. Well, leaving the parsonage and going to an aircraft carrier, did you feel like you had landed in Sodom and Gomorrah? I, it was, like I said, I, my first drink was in the Navy, and, uh, and I, I guess I never felt any peer pressure throughout college, which is unusual. I'm sure some people feel that. But when I went to the officers' club and, and everybody's ordering their gin and tonics or beers, I, I for, you know, had, had Cokes for a few t days, but then I tried the other and it wasn't too bad. What about gambling? Did you gamble in the Navy? No, I wasn't a gambler in the Navy. You I, waited until you got on the Supreme Court. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've been talking, I can tell you've been talking to some of my friends. We'll, we'll but, get to uh, your gambling later on. They think bingo is gambling. But, uh, well, let's go back to Vanderbilt for a minute. Uh, you played then on the varsity team for two years, is that right? Year and a half. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what what was it like playing for Vanderbilt right then? Were they were they a powerhouse or we really weren't that bad? Uh, I had had worked my way up to being number two behind Tom Moore, who was the uh, an all conference halfback, and uh, in in our senior year, and I wasn't on the team then. Uh, I think you know we won quite a few SEC games. I mean, for Vanderbilt, I think we were maybe. Uh, seven and, and three or, or six and four, and that's really good for Vanderbilt. Did you ever consider going to college anywhere other than Vanderbilt? Never did. It, it, Vanderbilt, uh, you know, it, it was the home school and it was cheaper. Uh, I, I got scholarshiped and could live at home, and then when I got on the football scholarship, I lived in the dorms, and uh, so I, I never. Uh, I guess this, that's part of the sheltered life. I never, I, I, I never imagined going as far away as Knoxville, you know. Or. Well, I was just going to ask, um, you, you and I over the years have, have enjoyed the Tennessee-Vanderbilt rivalry. Was Tennessee a big rival of Vanderbilt's back then? They were. They were. I don't consider them a big rival today. <laughs> but back that, in, you back mean in those because that Vanderbilt beat them so bad in 2005? <laughs> No, but uh, it was a big rivalry back then, but it was a good rivalry. Now, I don't think, uh, I'm not sure who Vanderbilt's rivalry, you know, MTSU's beat them the last three years, so we don't want to claim them as a rival, so. Well, when you, would you go to Knoxville and play them? Did, is that where you played Tennessee at yes. least every other year? Yeah. Was it on a just a field at that time, or was there a big stadium there? Then? No, there were, the, gosh, he uh, there was a sta there was Nayland Stadium. It, it, Did it, they have electricity back then? Oh yes, oh, oh yes, yes. <laughs> and 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 you know you had shoulder pads and leather helmets and the whole thing. Leather helmets. <laughs> that explains a few things. <laughs> Oh, boy. Now, did you ever consider going to any other branch of service in the Navy, or why did you pick the Navy? I picked, I guess, the Navy because it seemed, you know, you join the Navy and see the world with the billboards that you would see, and, uh, and, and the NROTC program at Vanderbilt was a good, strong program at that time. And, and you know, the NROTC, they, only, they had it at Georgia Tech and at Vanderbilt and Tulane and then the Eastern schools. So it was interesting when you went into the Navy on, on board an aircraft carrier, there were about 30 ensigns that showed up at about the same time I did. And all of them were from the Dartmouths and the Harvards and the very interesting people that you got to meet. And, you know, these are people that I spent two years with and we're, believe it or not, having a Shangri-La reunion uh, next October in San Antonio, Texas. So we're all getting together, and so uh, we've remained friends throughout. Two of the best years of my life. Were you just on the Shangri-La, or did you serve on other carriers no, as just, well? No, just, just the Shangri-La. You were placed on one ship and, and stayed that period of time. And you said you arrived as an ensign. Um, and I left as a lieutenant junior grade. After a year and a half, you pretty well automatically make JG, 
But the interesting thing is I stayed in the Navy Reserve and for another 27 years because I just enjoyed the Navy. So I would do Navy training duty during the summers and would end up on destroyers or uh, never ended up on another aircraft carrier. Uh, but uh, enjoyed my time in the Navy and, uh, and so that, that was one of the things I, it, it was interesting though, uh, uh, I, I did not get called back up like people have here recently. And I guess it was because back in those days you had the draft and everybody was in, it wasn't a volunteer army or Navy back in those days. So. I guess so you are you saying you expected to be drafted? Oh yes, and that's why you went ahead and if you wanted to be an officer, you went ahead and went Army ROTC or NROTC. All right. And what specifically was your duty on the Shangri-La? Well, it was interesting. It, I, I really learned a lot because here I am about a, a 21, 22 year old ensign and, and I'm in charge of a gunnery division of about 150 men who were all older than I and, uh, and very seaworthy and, uh, and uh, I learned a lot and uh, I think it was uh, really good for me as far as learning leadership skills and how to work with people and uh, so it, it was a great experience, really was. I bet that was a challenge. I'm sure they all didn't grow up in parsonages either. No, very much so. <laughs> in fact, that was probably one of the things that led me to the law because I, um, people in my deck division would get in trouble when they were ashore and I would have to go ashore and try to get them out of trouble and they would be under captain's mass which was the, the internal way of disciplining people and I would represent people in my deck division and so I was constantly uh, uh, doing legal type of work defending these people and uh, uh, as, as my time in the Navy was approaching to be over, I still was undecided what to do. So I took the LSAT while I was on board ship. Uh, and uh, there were about five of us that took it. And, uh, and I did pretty good on it. And so I decided, well, I'll, I'll try law school. And so I went to Vanderbilt, like I said, stayed at home and uh, had saved some money in the Navy to pay my way through Vanderbilt. And so, uh, and then getting out of Vanderbilt, uh, when I finished up, my sister had married a lawyer, Bill Carpenter, and Mr. Carpenter Sr. was an elder in our church and one of the founders of the church and just somebody that I had always admired. In fact, uh, in college, I had gone to hear him uh, in closing arguments in some of his uh, cases and uh, was very impressed with, with the bar of the state uh, back in, in the... Uh, that would have been the late 50s, I guess. It was interesting. The, in the summertime, the lawyers would wear the white suits, I guess, to be the good guys, you know. And white and, shoes. And white shoes, oh, very definitely. And, uh, and, and so it, I, I, that probably had a lot to do with my going into uh, law. And then out of law school, I really didn't, uh, my brother-in-law was at Good Pasture Carpenter, and it was Woods, and at that time, Courtney. It had been Good Pasture Carpenter, Woods, and Dale. Jim Dale left, that was Jim Dale Sr., and Wirt Courtney took his place. And then Wirt died uh, in an automobile accident. So then Jim Sasser became a named person in the firm. It was Good Pasture Carpenter, Woods, and Sasser. And it's interesting, had Wirt Courtney not been killed in that automobile accident, I doubt if I would have ever been interested in or gone on the Chancery bench because back in those days, the Chancery Court was a very mysterious court. You did not have oral testimony. Uh, you didn't, until you had the Rules of Civil Procedure, which was January of 71, and I went on the bench in 70, you, did, you didn't even have the same type of rules as you did in circuit court. So you could really get trapped. So I would say in Nashville, in the, in the when I was practicing law uh, in, in the mid to late 60s, I bet there were only about 50 lawyers that even attempted to practice law in Chancery Court. And Wirt Courtney was our Chancery Court lawyer in the firm. When he died, 
I was low man on the totem pole, I became the Chancery Court lawyer because none of the others wanted to do you it. You were an expert overnight, weren't you? Overnight. <laughs> you know, I took my Gibson suits in Chancery and read it cover to cover and, and, uh, and, and then spent about two years, basically all, all I was doing was Chancery work. And uh, so when Alf Adams, and the reason Alf Adams retired was because of these new rules of civil procedure that were on down the line. And he, he didn't want anything to do with summary judgments or depositions or any of that stuff. So he retired. And so... Uh, and that was the vacancy that you That took. was the vacancy that I took. Let's go back a couple of steps. It really sounds like that it was your brother-in-law that really got you first interested in, in the law. He and his father, the two of them together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you were in the Navy, how, what was the longest that you were out at sea? Well, we, we would leave Mayport, which was our home port, and be, you know, on board ship, living on the ship. Well, we lived, I lived on the ship, obviously, my full two years, but we would be in the Mediterranean for, you know, a seven-month cruise. Now, we would only be out at sea, you know, maybe two weeks at a time, and then you would come back into port. and. And, and that was the exciting thing to get to see parts of the world that you would never see. I mean, even when you The billboard go, was right. The billboard was <laughs> right. I mean, I have been back and done a Grecian Island cruise and, and have gone to Rhodes and some of these places, but uh, I've never been to Crete, you know, had it not been for the Navy or, or Palermo, Sicily. Nobody goes uh, to Sicily. And uh, so there were just, we really got to see uh, the Mediterranean. And we spent time in the Caribbean and spent time on a NATO cruise. And so I got to see uh, England. So it, it was uh, quite a, an experience. Did you ever lose any men in exercises? We lost quite a few pilots, believe it or not. Uh, uh, we lost an average of about six a year. So in my two years, we, lo we, only, we lost 10 in my two years. And, 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 and they were tragic and, and hurt the entire morale of the ship when it occurred because it always seems to be as it does in, in this day and age. It's always the best that seemed to die unexpectedly. And we had a pilot who was just a, a super, super sharp guy that, that de developed a program when we were in Greece of painting schools. And of course, all we had was ship gray. And, and most things are painted white in the Grecian islands and so forth. But there were a lot of schools and churches that are shipboard gray. But he got all of these things started, all of this kind of missionary work. And, and, and he died. And he died about two days before Easter Sunday. So the, we had a, an Easter service, as I recall, on the, the flight deck of the aircraft carrier. And, and uh, it was quite an emotional thing. And burial at sea? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because oh. that's the, not, he didn't always done that way, but that's the way he had requested it. Mm -hmm. um, my father was on the USS Lexington and, and burials at sea uh, it, for all of his life were some of the most emotional things he would ever see on television or experience. Mm -hmm. It leads me to this. You talked about practicing law without a license in the Navy. Did you, uh, did you, did you practice uh, ministry too? A little bit, a little bit, particularly with my, my group of, of, of sailors that I was with. I mean, I think they rubbed off on me, and hopefully I rubbed off on them to some degree. And did you all have church services uh, yeah. on we the had ship? A cha I tell you, an aircraft carrier, I mean, they're much larger now, but this was a midway class carrier, and we had about 5,000 men on board, and, and you add the air group when they get on board, and it's about 5,500 people, and so it's a little city, and uh, I mean, you had barber shops, and you had, we had a, uh, a Catholic chaplain and a Protestant chaplain, and, and uh, we had a rabbi uh, that would kind of rotate between the ships, and uh, so you always, yes, you had church services, and uh, and, and, it sh and, and one of the things it showed me, one of the first captains that we had on our ship never attended church. And church services were, were you know, th there might be 35 or 40 people on a ship that large. And, and we just met in a, in a little kind of storage room that was the chapel. The next captain that came on board, I mean, the first day that he was on board, he went to the church service, asked where the church service was. And it was funny how with the 
uh, officers on board, word spread that Captain Gilkerson was going to church. He had asked where it was. And so the XO, who had never been to church, the gunnery officer, they all showed up at that church service, and, uh, and, and the services got to the point where you had to have them either on the flight deck or on the hangar deck because so many people were in attendance. And, you know, I think that was an unusual type of leadership. I mean, people are going because the captain was going. But once he left, you know, and we had a new captain who wasn't as active with the church, they continued to go. So, you know, the, the preacher having had the opportunity to convert some lives, uh, it, he was able to continue to do so. So that, that was really a meaningful experience also for me in my Navy days. And the captain did it without opening his mouth. Oh, totally, yeah. He just asked, where, is the, where do you hold church services? <laughs> and word I, spread. I think everybody would agree that the best preaching is done without your mouth moving. Right. Well, um, did you play football on, on the flight deck? No, no, we, we didn't. That was a little too dangerous. That was a little it? too dangerous. Okay. Yeah, we didn't. Um, so we get out of uh, the Navy, and it's time to go to law school. And did you ever consider going anywhere else to law school? No, no. Once again, fortunately, I, I did have that Navy experience in between. I mean, had I gone to Vandy undergraduate and Vandy Law School and then into the practice of law, I mean, you talk about a sheltered life. I would have never really been exposed to the real world. But I think the two years in the Navy helped a lot. And, and, and basically why I went to Vandy Law School, uh, it, was a it was a good law school. won't say decent. Dean Wade wouldn't like that. It was a wonderful law school. <laughs> But, uh, but it was also I could live at home. And, and, uh, and at that point in time, uh, I, I, I was paying my own way, but I was on a partial scholarship because Dad was teaching at the Divinity School. So for some way, I got a partial scholarship to law school too. Because so, he was on the faculty. Yeah. So okay. it just all worked out. And, uh, and I, you know, I spent the, the, all three years of law school living at home, which hurt a little bit in that I wasn't as close to some of my classmates as I would have been had I been living on campus. Uh, but we had a great class. Uh, Riley Darnell, the Secretary of State, is a classmate of mine. Jerry Scott, who was a, 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 he is now a retired judge, but was a presiding judge of the Court of Criminal Appeals, was a classmate. Steve North, who was a, a trial judge here, was a classmate. So. We really had a fun, fun class, and, uh, and I think a really good class. We had, Dean Wade was the dean at the time, and he taught torts, and he was excellent. Uh, Paul Hartman taught contracts. I guess Paul Hartman taught everybody contracts and corporations, uh, I forget when he finally retired, but he was kind of one of those people that was uh, uh, always known. And uh, so we had a good faculty, and, and it rubbed off. Was there any particular course that you liked? You, you've had torts as sort of a, an area of yeah, interest. I, and over I guess the years. torts simply because of Dean Wade. I mean, he was, uh, he was very involved in the restatement and uh, was on that committee and uh, was just really nationally known in his field and, and uh, was an excellent teacher. And what about law review or moot court? Were you involved in that? It was involved in moot court and. Uh, you know, my mind back in those days, though, was on a little girl that was up at Wellesley, and she really kind of ruined my grades because I would spend the nights writing these long letters to her, and because uh, I was too cheap to use the phone, <laughs> and we didn't, <laughs> and we didn't, you know, you didn't have uh, emails back then. Boy, technology has helped things. My my little 13-year-old grandson now is emailing his girlfriend and setting up dates and so forth. So times have changed, Buck. Yeah, but it sure has created a lot of discovery issues. <laughs> <laughs> Did she write you back? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Did you all keep any of those letters? I think, I think we have some. In retirement, I may uh, have some time to go back and dig those out and uh, Good. see what we had to say. It'd probably be very interesting. <laughs> you can decide which ones to burn and which ones to keep, can't you? Um, well, you, you were telling us earlier about how you ended up in private law practice. Did you consider criminal law or 
the district attorney's office or any other uh, paths at that time? At that time, no, because like I said, I had, had, had seen uh, Mr. Carpenter in action. I enjoyed, the, thought that I would enjoy trying lawsuits. They were basically a criminal defense firm, so they, back in those days, you, you know, that was before mediation and, and much arbitration, and, and you basically tried everything. I mean, uh, you were in court on a daily basis, and I talk to some trial judges now, and you know, uh, if they have 15 trials a year, that's, that's good. And uh, back in those days, the trial judges, though, were in court with jury trials every day, and because it was rare that you settled for some reason. Uh, I think it's good that we've gone past that, but but I thought I wanted to be a trial lawyer, and so uh, that's you know they offered me a job, and and I took it, uh, and uh, and enjoyed the practice, and like I said, was fortunate that I got the exposure in Chancery Court because when the opening came up, there weren't many people that felt comfortable going into Chancery. Now I was not. Frank Grell was with Bass, Barry, and Sims, and I'm sure he was a he had been a lieutenant governor and was a close friend of uh, Buford Ellington, who was the governor at that time. My understanding is Buford didn't really like lawyers and wanted to get a decision made quick before lawyers started bombarding him, saying we would like to be appointed. So he that's would, not limited to that governor. The governor. Right. So he kind of turned this particular appointment over to Frank Gorell, and I assume there wasn't anybody in Bassberry that wanted to do it because <laughs> he then, they asked Bill Woods in our firm. Or at firm, least nobody that Frank didn't want to keep at the keep, firm. Yeah, keep, that was probably <laughs> it. And, but he asked Bill Woods, and, uh, and, and Bill turned it down. Then he asked Bill Carpenter, Jr., and he turned it down. They asked Jim Sasser, and he turned it down. So they got to the low man on the totem pole, and he asked me, and I said, well, can I think about it? Because even then, the low man on the totem pole, I was taking a cut in salary. The pay for judges then was 15000 It had been twelve five, and in 70, it had just been moved up to 15000 So people with families, just like Jim Sasser and Bill Carpenter, Bill Woods, you couldn't afford it. So who you were getting as judges were really judges, people that were kind of in retirement perhaps, or uh, people that were young and could afford it. And uh, so I, I feel blessed to have gotten it. I, I uh, really questioned whether to do it and, and slept on it and uh, finally decided it was, Thomas Wardlow Steele had been a Davidson County Chancellor for two years. I think his picture's down there, isn't it? Yes, and he, he, he was the Baker versus Carr. He, he decided Baker versus Carr correctly and then was reversed and then the U.S. Supreme Court affirmed him. And, uh, but then after two years, he went back in the practice of law and it certainly didn't hurt his practice of law any. So I thought, well, I'll at least try it for two years. But after two years, when I had to run for re-election, for election at that time, I just thoroughly enjoyed it and the people I was around and the Nashville bar and since being on the appellate courts, I've seen it statewide that we have such a good bar in Tennessee. But the Nashville bar was just, incredible and it was so much fun trying lawsuits with just outstanding lawyers. I mean it really made made it fun. We'll talk maybe some more about this later but does it worry you that lawyers have so much trouble getting trial practice, uh, trial, actual trial experience? It, it, it has, uh, it, it has changed uh, and I you know, you, you had a certain group of lawyers back in the, in the 60s and the 70s and perhaps in the 80s, and, uh, and you still have the outstanding lawyers, but you had people like John Nolan was a plaintiff's lawyer, and he just would not settle with you. So as, as defense counsel, I mean, because he just enjoyed trying them. And he would not settle with you. You would you would give him your policy limits, and he wouldn't <laughs> settle with you. You know, and so it it, it 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 has changed a bit. It really has. You mentioned the job being offered to Senator Sasser, Jim Sasser, who of course became a United States Senator later. Was he was he a partner when you were an associate, or was he a senior associate when you were an associate? As I recall, there were just 
three partners. I mean, Mr. Goodpasture, Mr. Carpenter, and Mr. Woods, they got the big part of the pie, and the others were kind of working for them. And uh, I, I guess when, I, I am sure Jim was, I was on salary, and I don't know whether, Jim was obviously on salary when I first started with the firm, mm -hmm. because we thought the salaries were, were way too low, but uh, uh, I think everybody Did you make under $20,000 a year? Do you remember? Probably when it started, I, I probably did, yeah. Well, you talked about the chancellors making 15000 15, yeah. When I was your law clerk in 1980, I made seventeen five. So was, did you make about seventeen five as an associate when you started? Probably, I guess. And I guess it's never, ever been true that being a judge didn't involve a pay cut for any lawyer that went on the bench. Probably not. I, I can't imagine uh, and yet we have really developed, fortunately, I will say this, and, and I think it's because the legislature has recognized it and also governors have recognized it, that to get a good judiciary you need to be somewhat competitive. Uh, you don't have to make the same salaries as lawyers because you know you, you're not, you can't afford, the state can't afford to pay that. But they have made the salaries competitive now. And so uh, we've got a, a, a pay bill this year up to help raise the salaries to make them more competitive because there hadn't been, there have been cost of living adjustments, but n never a, a, a merit uh, pay bill. And, uh, and I, uh, hopefully uh, that will go through. The legislative leadership is backing it because they see the need uh, to do that. It's interesting, when I went on the bench, the reason the salaries were so low is the legislature wasn't willing to pay, but they were willing to give you a good retirement. So those that went on the bench prior to 74 have an excellent retirement because they got no pay, but the legislature could put it off until the retirement years. And some of us, like Ben Cantrell and myself, stayed on way beyond I mean, we could have retired after 20 years, so I could have retired in 1990, but I stayed on 15 more years uh, beyond just because I enjoyed it. But, uh, but I, after 74, the pay started to increase and get better, and, and with that, the retirement benefits started to decrease, which is unfortunate. I don't think a lot of people realize the public service that people with your profile and Ben's profile rendered um, because really you were making very little additional money in the last five or ten years of, of your career compared to what you could have gotten with your pension. And well Ben and I like I said we were basically working for about 20 percent of our salary because we were entitled to, to uh, 75 percent of it in retirement and, uh, uh, and then we've been paying in still so those were uh, types of things it just shows there are a lot of Herschel Franks could have retired a long time ago sure. and, and he's seeking re-election this year uh, so it just really proves people are out there the judges uh, he's the presiding judge of the Court of Appeals but he certainly isn't doing it for the money because he's working for about 20 percent of, of his salary which means he's making a whole lot less than his secretary they're just doing it because they love it because they love it and you're practicing law because you love it. So given all these financial disincentives and the fact that you didn't know whether you were going to love it or not, why did you take the job back then to well, become I, a chancellor? Well, I took the job basically because I had a, a two-year-old daughter and a, about a three-month-old son, and they were not in the school range yet, so I could afford it at that point in time. And uh, so I really went into it thinking I'll do this two years and see how it goes. And I just uh, fell in love with it. And when you, when you say fall in love with your job, it's a combination of things. It's, it's the local judges that, sh that, that you care much a whole lot about, but it's also the judicial conference. It's just one big family. I mean, Claire and I, when Claire went to her first judicial conference, I was 32 and she was 25. And all the older judges kept saying, now whose daughter are you? Because she about, was about the age of some of the older judges' daughters. And, uh, 
they just uh, opened up their arms and were just so good to both of us. And, uh, and we've tried to do the same thing as we have gotten older when newer judges come in knowing uh, how, you know, I, I think when George McCandless was on the Supreme Court and at the first judicial conference, he came over and spoke to me. And I, I was just on cloud nine, you know. And I, and, and I think the other members of the court continue to try to do that as the new judges come on board. I think sometimes the senior judges and senior law partners don't realize that the smallest act can have such a profound impact on a young judge or, mm -hmm. or a young lawyer. Um, how long had you been practicing when you went on when you were appointed by the governor? I'd only been practicing five years, and that's and just were you the youngest of, judge in the state. Yeah. Were you the youngest person that had ever been appointed judge in the state? I think so. I, that's what they told me back then. Uh, and I don't, there have been some young judges, but I don't know that any have been. When I was appointed, I was 31. When I was sworn in, I had just turned 32. So that was pretty young. And, and, uh, you had to and, be and, and I was dealing with K, the Davidson County Chancery Bench back then, and, and as it is today. Uh, being in the capital city, you got all your constitutional questions. You got all your tax issues came through there. You just had, and back then, where everything was by deposition, no oral testimony, uh, it was kind of a rich man's court because you had to have a decent lawsuit and you couldn't afford to bring it in Chancery Court back in the dark ages. And I would think also sort of similar to an appellate court because you didn't yeah. hear live testimony, you didn't have many jury trials, if any. No, very much so. So yeah. you're really reading a record and deciding questions of law. Yeah. And, I, and I, I may be digressing, but when I took the bench, I think, I don't, I don't think Chancellor Adams, I don't know whether he kept as busy a docket as he gave me. I assume he must have. But he had a case set at 9 every morning and one set at 1 every morning. And by case, these are major cases because the lawyers would come in with boxes of deposition and then you would hear the oral argument in the case on the merits and then you're to take it back, read all the depositions and make a decision and have to make written findings. And uh, you know, one a day would have been more than an average person could handle, but he had one at nine and one at one, and it was spread out for nine months. And I went over and asked Chancellor Lentz, who was my co-chancellor, I said, when did he ever take a vacation? And he said, Chancellor Adams just didn't take vacations. <laughs> so uh, I, I really got into the heat of it right away. And, and B Ben Cantrell took Lentz's place after two years. And Ben and I literally uh, kept asking the Chancery Court Committee of the Nashville Bar that we needed a third chancellor. But that, it, it, that hap doesn't happen overnight. We started asking in like 73 and it occurred when Bob Brandt came on and I think it was either 76 or 78 but uh, Ben and I spent every Saturday and Sunday down at the courthouse and I got to know Ben well and got to know his daughters well because his wife Rose was in, in law school at the time. So Ben was giving the two girls to babysit and so he would put them in the courtroom and they would write on the chalkboard or draw. And it was so interesting every Monday when lawyers would come into the courtroom, <laughs> they never knew what they were going to see, you know, what Ben's daughters had, uh, had done over the weekend. And uh, fortunately, they were good artists. And, and, uh, but it, it, it makes you close to people. I, I had the good fortune of seeing them grow up to young ladies. And his oldest daughter, I performed the wedding ceremony. So uh, that, that is kind of one of the things about the entire judicial conference. We're, we're a family. Your dad was a member of that family. You know what it was like. And uh, uh, it, it's just very special. I think it keeps judges staying on beyond retirement years. Judge, we've been going about uh, an hour and 10 minutes. Maybe this would be a good time to take a break. Okay. Judge, uh, you mentioned that you were appointed to the bench and then elected to the bench. Um, you have also been appointed to the Court of Appeals and you've been nominated to the Supreme Court by the State Democratic Executive Committee. So you've, you've seen a lot of different uh, judicial selection processes um, except the one that most judges today go through, which is the Judicial Selection Commission. Commission. 
I, I want to I solicit your views on the relative merits of, of these different ways of selecting judges, what you found interesting about them, and what you liked and what you didn't like. So compare them for me. Compare election versus appointment and, and your various experiences with each of those processes. Well, election, uh, you know, my first real election was 72 when I was running for chance, running for not re-election, but for election uh, after having served for two years. And I had uh, two candidates running against me. And, and one of them later got disbarred because of the types of things not only he did in an election against me, but two years later he ran against Ben Cantrell. And he got disbarred when he was practicing law down in Florida. But, can, I, can I interrupt you just a minute? Yeah. You're saying that he got disbarred for his campaign no, techniques? No, not, not for his, but, but, but it didn't surprise Ben or myself that he later got disbarred because of the types of things that he was doing and saying. Uh, but I guess I really enjoyed getting out and meeting everyone. I didn't enjoy the fundraising aspect, although I really wasn't involved in, in that that much. Uh, I guess the 1980 race where you're running statewide against a candidate uh, was even the tougher race than a, a local Davidson County race. Uh, but I would say I enjoyed both of the experiences, but I do not think, particularly in a statewide race for the Supreme Court, that that's the best way to do it, simply because I've seen what's happened in too many other states, Texas, for example, where you literally have to raise three to five million dollars to run. Uh, Alabama, Mississippi have had expensive campaigns. Uh, North Carolina, uh, Supreme Court races, you have to raise over a million dollars to run. Ohio, uh, my good friend Tom Moyer up there had to raise multi-millions of dollars. And what it turns out to be you get the National Chamber of Commerce getting involved, you get the trial lawyers getting involved, you get labor involved, you get a lot of interest groups that are pouring large sums of money into these races and I just don't think it's healthy and, and what it turns out to be is a kind of a popularity contest who can be on television the most. Uh, I really think the merit selection that we have under the Tennessee plan and the merit retention. I mean, both have merit to lead it off and I think both of them uh, work that way, hopefully. Uh, the merit selection process, we're all, we even have that for the trial judges now. Now the trial judges do run in contested races and I think most of them enjoy that and if you took a vote of the trial judges, they would prefer to have contested races over a, a, a merit sol, uh, retention plan. Uh, Is that because they'd rather run against another human being than, than run? I, either yes that or, no? or run unopposed. Because if you've done a good job as a trial judge and you're running unopposed, you just have that one vote, you vote yourself and you're in. Uh, there's always the possibility in, in, in a retention that some issue may come up at the last minute and you could not get your 50% of the vote. So I think that's kind of where they're coming from. I think the intermediate and the Supreme Court judges realize that this is the best route because to try to raise money to run statewide is extremely difficult. In 1980, when George Brown and I ran, I raised about $65,000 and George raised about the same amount. And so that is obviously low budget. I mean, people raise more than that to run in Shelby County, in Davidson County now. Uh, but that's what we raised back then. In 82, when the Supreme Court, the entire court was running, we decided to run as a team, as a court. Fortunately, Harbison and I didn't have opposition, but Phones and Brock and Cooper did have opposition. And so we had a major fundraiser out at the Opryland Hotel and I think we raised totally for that whole campaign maybe seventy, seventy-five thousand dollars once again for the, whole for, court. for the whole court in a statewide race. In 1990, we uh, raised some money 
uh, on the front end, and then the Republicans did not run a slate against the Democratic slate. So we did not have to raise a whole lot of money after the initial uh, raising of money. And I'm not sure why to this day the Republicans didn't run a slate because Republicans were very strong in 1990. It may have been due to the fact that uh, the Democratic Executive Committee uh, appointed the first woman in Sissy Daughtry. Uh, uh, both Riley Anderson and, and Lyle Reed were well known and well respected and well regarded. So they may have just thought it was going to be a tough race and not to run anybody. But in 1993, due to the efforts primarily of Lyle Reed and John Wilder, we got the Tennessee plan. And uh, so the, the 96 race that Penny White was in was a retention election. And we all know the unfortunate results of that. Uh, but in 98, the entire court ran. Uh, and everyone was elected uh, by varying amounts. And, uh, and th there was a lot said about the qualifications of the candidates. And uh, I, I, I just felt comfortable with the way that that election ran, not because everybody was reelected, but because the judicial evaluation that was conducted was, was extremely good. It, it's, not only do the clerks of the courts and the judges at the trial level and intermediate level and Supreme Court rate you uh, in all number of ways, but the lawyers who have tried cases in your courts over the last year also evaluate you. So these judicial evaluations uh, put the numbers out there for the judges to see. And not only do they help the public in knowing, but they help the judge in knowing their weaknesses. And uh, I have found the judicial evaluations to be extremely beneficial to a court. You can sit down now as a court and, and discuss your own evaluations and your strengths and your weaknesses. So I, I guess I I'm a, would be opposed to contested races at the appellate level because of the amount of money that would have to be raised. I mean, I told you what we raised in, in, in 82 and in 90. Uh, and, and you just don't, uh, I think it's unhealthy uh, to raise millions and millions of dollars. For example, in Texas, such large sums of money have come from certain law firms. When the Rule 11s have been granted, there was a suit filed in the federal court asking that the Supreme Court of Texas disclose how each member voted on the Rule 11. There are nine member court on, on the application on the application to appeal. because certain applications weren't being granted on the applications for permission to appeal and and I guess certain lawyers were wondering whether certain law firms who contributed half a million dollars to a certain judge is getting some type of preferential treatment and uh, that just in Tennessee those issues don't come up and, and I, I want to go back to transparency in a little while, but I, let's pick up on this issue, though, of the present merit selection plan. Um, as you mentioned, in, in the urban counties in Tennessee, um, it's beginning to take as much as $100,000 to to run a campaign, especially in Davidson County, where you have party primaries. Um, many lawyers, therefore, would support merit selection for the trial judges as well, not just for the initial filling of the vacancy, but for retention once it was time for the, the remaining term to be filled. Is that something that, that has merit in your judgment? I think it certainly has merit in my judgment uh, for the, the Trial Lawyers Association has not been for that uh, in the last few years. Uh, and, and certain legislators have not been for it. So it really has not become an issue. Uh, it's, it's almost been a non-issue. Uh, I think what may happen is you'll have some highly contested races where tons of money has been raised and it, and it gets a little ugly and that may be when the legislature and others will take a new look at it. Well, maybe this is as good a time as any to talk about the attorney general selection process, which is 
unique as far as I know in the state of Tennessee. Is there any other state that selects their attorney general I, by the Supreme Court? I think we're the only only state. Right. And 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 you know you get criticism and you hear other people say you're the only state that does it. So obviously it needs to be changed. And and you might say there is some merit if there. Now we'll say of the other 49 states, they all do it different ways. But uh, we're the only one where the Supreme Court does it. And as we sit here today in March of 2006, uh, there's a bill that's actually been moved out of subcommittee to uh, change the selection process uh, for the Attorney General to make the Attorney General popularly elected. What's your view on whether that's a good idea or? I, you I think that would be a big, big mistake because having been on the inside and seeing what goes into the appointment of the Attorney General. I, I was involved in the point on the reappointment of Bill Leach, of Mike Cody, uh, of Charles Burson, of Knox Walkup, and of Paul Summers. So I've been in the seen the process firsthand five different people. Uh, and in the in in all of those cases, you're looking for somebody that can run one of the state's largest law firms. It's not the largest, but it is a rather large law firm. So you want somebody that can be a, uh, at least know what office managing is all about and also that can litigate and have good judgment. And uh, so you are familiar with the processes that we have gone through. And, and lately it has been an open process. Well, I will say with regards to Bill Leach on his reappointment, we just met with Bill Leach and basically discussed various issues with him and reappointed him. Uh, then when he resigned, rather than open up the process, uh, I think the court felt if they could get somebody like a Mike Cody, we would be lucky. Uh, once again, it's kind of like getting a judge. Mike Cody took a tremendous salary decrease to uh, become Attorney General and to move from Memphis to Nashville and move your family. Uh, but he agreed to do it for a period of time, as did Charles Burson. Uh, and, and that one was done in the same way. Uh, there was a lot of criticism, and, and we received criticism from the local print media, uh, that it should have been an open process. We had been told that when, when the initial Attorney General was appointed in 74 by the 74 court, which was an open process, that had it been a closed process, you would have had some senior partners in major law firms that would have applied. But they weren't going to you know, just get into an open process, make their clients feel like they were ready for a change make their partners feel like, you know, they were burned out. And so uh, they did not apply. But the court was advised of this after the fact. So that's why Bill Leach, Mike Cody, Charles Burson, we had that process. When Charles Burson retired, uh, uh, Al, I, I think Al Birch was definitely on the court at that time. And he was specifically wanted to have an open process. and. Uh, and the others did not disagree with him. So we, we had an open process for the next two, as you know. But totally based upon merit, we, we did have good people apply uh, for both of those uh, uh, positions. And uh, so I guess what I'm saying is an attorney general who is seeking re-election, number one, or seeking election, has to raise a lot of money because it's a statewide race. The opinions that come out of the Attorney General's office can be political because you've got a political Attorney General, you've got an Attorney General that is probably going to seek re-election or seek election for the United States Senate or for Governor, which really happens a great deal in some of your southern states. And so the election of Attorney General is kind of a stepping stone for higher office. And one of the things we have always asked when we're discussing it with an attorney, somebody who's seeking the attorney general, is this just a stepping stone for you? Do you have higher political aspirations or do you want to be the attorney general of the state? 
And the answer that we have received is that no, they don't intend to run for, for senator or president, that they want to be attorney general, something they've always wanted to do. Some have said, I may not be able to do it a full eight-year term. Others have said, if nominated, I would do it for an eight-year term. But uh, I think you're getting a, a person that is making all of these opinions that the attorney general makes when legislators request or the governor requests. Uh, you know, that's a, a, an opinion based upon merit and, and not seeing how the wind is blowing because they're not elected by the public. Now, on the other hand, I can certainly see where the public feels like this is a, a powerful position and perhaps should be elected by the public. But my more, long answer is uh, I, I like it the way it is. One more issue about the Attorney General before we go back to your career. I think that uh, one of the issues about the Attorney General's position appointed as, as he or she is in Tennessee by the court is the independence of the Attorney General. Um, let me give you an example of a recent development and, and ask if, if you think this is healthy or troublesome. Um, when the court decided it's rendered its decisions on some of the criminal sentencing issues in Tennessee, the Attorney General filed a pretty aggressive petition to rehear and uh, you know, indicated that uh, he he disagreed quite uh, zealously with the court's conclusion. And the court put down an order saying that if the attorney general didn't feel comfortable advancing the position of the court um, with respect to the, the sentencing issues in the federal courts or in the Supreme Court, that the court would appoint special counsel. Um, do you think that it's healthy that there's that independence between the attorney general and the court, or did that was that a sort of a troublesome development? No, I think it's it's definitely good that there is the independence uh, of the attorney general. I disagreed with with the attorney general on that issue because the court had spoken. I mean, truthfully, the state of Tennessee won. We upheld the constitutionality of the statute in a split decision, but the majority upheld it, and and wh from where I sit. Uh, then the Attorney General is to defend that position and not say that the statute's unconstitutional. And when it went to the U.S. Supreme Court, there was no brief supporting the position of the majority of the Tennessee Supreme Court. Charles Burson called me because he had heard of this and said, I can't believe what the Attorney General is doing. And I said, well, I can't believe it either, but that's the that's what an attorney general can do. So he, uh, an attorney general, does feel their own independence, and I think that's that's good. So while you may not agree with every decision they make, that I guess the court would respect the attorney general's independence in that regard to 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 take those positions as they see fit, and that would include not defending a, a decision of the Supreme Court in the federal courts. Right. Let's go back to, uh, to your times on the Chancery bench. Uh, what's the most embarrassing thing that ever happened to you while you were a chancellor? <laughs> well, you and I have a mutual friend in, in Cecil Croson, but he, who is known as a real prankster, and uh, you got to know him when you were working with the Supreme Court. Who later became the clerk of the Supreme Court. Later became the, the clerk of the entire uh, appellate court. Which is amazing in and of itself. <laughs> <laughs> But Cecil was clerking for Chancellor Lentz, who was the other chancellor at the time, and, uh, and I had uh, a case in, involving, uh, well, I had, I had two things that Cecil has done to me, but I had a case involving Deep Throat that Tommy Shriver, who was the DA, was trying to uh, put, uh, enjoin the showing of Deep Throat as it being obscene, and it was at a local downtown movie theater and back in 72 you had some downtown theaters still at that time and uh, Cecil approached me by saying I think there will be a large crowd and would you mind if I sold popcorn I thought he was joking until I saw that he had brought his popcorn popper in the whole thing and I said no no we're not gonna sell <laughs> popcorn for the movie uh, but I was surprised when I walked into the courtroom and it was just packed and uh, we had the uh, publisher of the Banner on the front row, the editor of the Tennessean on the front row, uh, Drew Smith, uh, who we would all know would be on the front row. Famous Capitol Hill reporter. Yes, 
But uh, a, a lot of uh, lawyers who I was surprised that had no interest in in how this, no professional interest. no professional interest who were there, and I thought they either were embarrassed to be seen at the at the downtown theater and were not being in Chancery Court, or they were too cheap and wanted to see a free movie. <laughs> but uh, it was interesting uh, that the, I, I, I selected a, a jury, and back in those days we really didn't have juries in, in Chancery Court, and so it was an advisory jury and I just hand-picked it, which was probably a mistake. We had two reporters, John McLemore, who's a lawyer now uh, in Nashville, who was the court reporter for the uh, Banner, and Ken Jost was working for the Tennessee, and he is now a lawyer and does a, a legal journal out of California. So two bright young men, and so I put them on this jury along with some other outstanding uh, citizens, and uh, they came back that the movie was not obscene. And for anybody that's seen the movie, or maybe it's me being a preacher's kid, but it certainly was obscene, so I had to overrule the jury. So, uh, and, and that met with some interesting comments. Was this what you would call a blue ribbon jury? A blue ribbon jury. And, and so in, in asking jurors why they decided it that way, Tommy Shriver, Shriver who was the uh, DA at the time, loved music. He played in a, in a country band himself. And he was tapping his foot to the music in Deep Throat. And they decided if the Attorney General likes this movie, it can't be obscene. Uh, a few days after that, I had another, another major case in which almost all the, well, I won't say all the prominent lawyers in Nashville, but we had the Dick Lanston was there, Harlan Dodson was there. Uh, uh, we had some state senators that were there. Uh, and, and after lunch, I went to sit down and lean back as I usually do, and the chair just went totally out from under me and my feet went flying high, the robe went over my head, and I guess that would be one of life's most embarrassing moments for a 34-year-old a judge with all of these old senior prominent lawyers. And uh, they came to my rescue very quickly, uh, which was kind of surprising. And uh, I don't recall whether it was Harlan Dodson or Dick Lanson who, Judge, are you hurt? And, and Cecil to this day claims that he had nothing uh, to do with fixing my chair, but I think we all know that he did. So in answer to your most embarrassing, I guess that fits in the category. How did Cecil know that you wouldn't fire him on the spot? He was Chancellor Lentz's law clerk. How did Cecil know <laughs> Chancellor Lentz wouldn't fire him on the spot? I don't know, I don't know. But Cecil, as you and I know, has pulled a lot of things on a lot of people, including Bill Harbison on the Supreme Court and others, and so he just tended to get away with it. Well, while we're on the subject of Cecil, what did Cecil do to, to Justice Harbison? Cecil was doing things that a lot of people didn't know about, but in one particular case, we had a case out of uh, uh, Knoxville where there was a 72-year-old woman who was in prison uh, and her mother, who was 92, was in the courtroom. And the lawyer kept saying, you know, and it was over, kind of, it started out as a boundary line dispute, and they claimed that this 72-year-old who was in prison had stolen some farm equipment out of a barn of a neighbor. And it had gotten all the way to the Supreme Court, and I think just because we had real pity for this woman whose mother was 92 and needed her to be at home, uh, and we heard the case, and it was assigned to Harbison, and yet, in, in conference, we decided there really wasn't anything we could do about it. I mean, it was a legally sound. The jury had no evidentiary issues that were problems. And so we knew what he was going to have to do. And, and Cecil uh, called Harbison from back in those days. You could tell if it was long distance if you were outside of the county. So he drove to Columbia to call long distance so he would know it was a long distance call and imitated this little old lady. And, and put poor Judge Harbison through the ringer. And Judge Harbison kept saying, I cannot discuss this case with you, but we are concerned, and went on and on. And then Cecil had the nerve to have taped it and played it at a court dinner. And, and as you say, he was still hired, so I'm not sure why. <clears throat> you know, one of those the best- those who don't know Cecil, I guess the, the closest thing to comparing to might be maybe a Tony Randall 
or he was very fastidious about his dress, and I understand that uh, he enjoyed critiquing the the uh, wearing apparel of the members of the court as well, especially perhaps Judge Henry. Judge Henry and he had a wonderful time together because Judge Henry thought leisure suits were going to come in. Uh, <laughs> come and, in or come back? <laughs> well, I don't I don't know. This this was like in the mid 70s. So, but he would wear his leisure suits, and Cecil would give him a hard time. And uh, Judge Henry would give him a hard time about his ties and, and one time just cut one of his most expensive ties off and, and Cecil couldn't believe it was happening and didn't know how to respond. But my favorite Cecil story in Joe Henry, Cecil traveled with the court some. The court stayed in the, the, the now, when, 70... When Cecil traveled with Joe Henry, he would have been a staff attorney. Cecil at that time was a, yes was a staff attorney for the for the entire Supreme Court, and he wouldn't always travel. But for some reason he was I recall he was in Jackson at least I've been told this story about him, and 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 they stayed in a cheap motel. Uh, this this occurred when I got on the court in '80. We would stay at this hotel because it, it was 1999. And uh, it was awful, and the doors opened out onto the sidewalk, and it was a single story type thing, and it's where all the truckers stayed, and they would start their engines about 5.30 in the morning. But Cecil found a lady of the night and, and asked her to knock on uh, Bob Cooper's door uh, and, and make a proposition. And, and the lady did, but it turned out to be Harbison's door. <laughs> Well, those who know Bill Harbison, they said his blood rushed to his face. He was very red-faced and didn't invite her in, but told her to go next door to Joe Henry's room. <laughs> and she proceeds to go to Joe Henry's room, and Joe invites her in. And so they were all standing around, but, you know, it didn't, she wasn't in Joe's room very long, just about 10 minutes. But Joe was trying to convince her that she should be doing other things with her life. But I, I don't think she ever... He ever totally sold her on that, but Joe Henry was a, a marvelous person. And and when I first went on the court in '80, and we went to Jackson, stayed at that same uh, motel, and we walked to Shoney's for breakfast, they were all wondering whether I was going to order grits, and I had no idea why they were so interested in whether I was going to order grits. And it turns out the last time they had been in Jackson, and Joe was on the court. They had a, a special of, of $1.39, and you got your eggs and bacon and grits and biscuits and juice for $1.39. Uh, Joe said that he didn't want the grits. So when the bills came, the other four got their bill for $1.39. His was $2.39. And it was because, as she said, the waitress said, he had ordered a la carte because he didn't get the grits. And Joe says, I want to see the manager. And the manager comes up and he says, you mean to tell me, had I had the grits, I would have gotten $1.39, but I didn't want the grits, so it's costing me a dollar more? And the man says, yes, you ordered a la carte. Well, I mean, Joe was about to go ballistic, as you can imagine. Well, Bill Harbison, being Bill Harbison in The Mediator, he paid the dollar to the man to tell Joe he could have his for $1.39. <laughs> and, and so everyone went out. But they were really hoping that I didn't like grits and I was going to order it a la carte. <laughs> to but see I, how you'd react. To see how I carte. would react. So that's how I learned of, of the Joe Henry and his grits. <laughs> what was a typical day like you mentioned that you had a case set at nine in the morning and and i think at one in the afternoon right um would you have to take work home every night to try to keep up you really did and i you know the fact that you were hearing them one in the morning and one in the afternoon obviously didn't have time to read the depositions and write an opinion uh in that period of time you were taking cases under advisement so the, the cases under advisement were really building up. And it wasn't until I went to a judicial conference, our family, as we discussed earlier, that we had a meeting with the chancellors. And Lynn Broughton, the chancellor from Knoxville, uh, told me, said, never take a case under advisement. Make sure you've read the materials ahead of time and listen to oral argument and rule from the bench. And so uh, I took his advice, and, and that helped me in a way to, uh, to finally get caught up. 
but Ben Cantrell and I were, you know, spending every Saturday and every Sunday afternoon uh, down at the courthouse, and, and that continued until they got a third chancellor. And then when Bob Brandt came and he had three chancellors, it pretty much evened the workload. Was there, is there a significant case or a couple of cases that stand out as your, in your mind as being more important or more newsworthy uh, as you look back on your chancery career? Well, it, it was interesting that uh, as, as a young chancellor in 72, I was 34 years old, and I was deciding who was going to sit on the Supreme Court. There was the Taylor Turley lawsuit, and uh, Bob Taylor was a former uh, Court of Appeals judge from West Tennessee, and, and Turley was the U.S. attorney from, from Shelby County, and Turley was appointed by Governor Winfield Dunn, so he had a certificate of appointment, and Taylor ran a write-in campaign, so he had a certificate of election from the Election Commission. So you had two different people, so it was a perfect quo warranto. In law school, you always wonder, what is a quo warranto <laughs> proceeding? And this was the perfect one because there were two people vying for the the same spot. And so as the young chancellor, I went through it all and decided that neither one of them met the criteria that they were seeking it under. And, uh, and it went directly to the Supreme Court and they affirmed me and therefore uh, they went through the process again and Bill Phones subsequently was appointed uh, to the Supreme Court. So I've always told Bill Phones that he would have never gotten on the court in 73 had it not been for me. But he never took that very seriously and never gave me any credit for that. But those are the types of cases. The tax cases dealt with the constitutionality of the property tax that had, had passed constitutional amendment to change the property tax scheme. And that was about in 73, 74, I guess. And so that had statewide implication. And as a young chancellor, those were interesting cases. Uh, South Central Bell would seek rate increases, so you would have those rate type of cases which were very difficult. In fact, my first reported opinion is in the public utility reports, the PERS as we call it. In 73 as a chancellor, I was in the volume of the public utility reports. So, uh, that dates you, doesn't it? That dates you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so Davidson Chancery was a fun, fun place to be because you had a lot of great cases. And I think that's what really helped me with the appointment to the Court of Appeals in 74, the fact that I had had such high profile cases. My batting average was pretty good from my first two years before I ran for election. I guess I had heard, now some of these were workers' comps that weren't is it complicated, but about a thousand opinions were heard, and out of that thousand, only 21 were appealed uh, during that first two years, and I'd been affirmed in all 21 of them. And so, as part of my campaign, the Tennessean picked up on that and, and wrote it up. Well, apparently, Shriver and Todd, who were sitting on the middle section, uh, thought, well, what has been up here 21 times and we've never reversed him? The next five cases I had were reversed. <laughs> I don't know whether there was any correlation, probably bad decisions on my part, but, but that was, uh, was interesting. How, how, do you, how, do you think, how did you feel and how do you think most trial judges feel when they get overruled? I mean, does it, does it sting or it, have it, you it moved stings, on? Uh, but, you know, it was funny. Uh, Alf Adams said, don't keep score. When I, when, I mean, that was some of his first advice to me, don't keep score. And when I was cleaning out his desk, I saw where he had kept score for a number of years mm -hmm. and then had quit keeping score. So I guess that's why he told me He to learned do. my experience yeah, not to keep score. Yeah, not to keep score. Uh, what was interesting, I would have certain cases, uh, say, involving, uh, as an example, Commerce Union Bank back in those days, and they would bring in a young attorney that would argue the case before me, and I would decide it against Commerce Union Bank. And then they would bring in their heavyweight, Bill Harbison, to take that case on up to the uh, Court of Appeals or to the Supreme Court. And, and Harbison would cite all of this authority that had not been presented to me as a chancellor. 
And uh, so those were the types that you often wondered, why didn't you give me your best shot at first? And that's one of the things about being a judge and one of the things I've enjoyed so much, though, particularly at the appellate level. You have such good lawyers arguing the cases before you. It makes your job as a judge a whole lot easier. The better the lawyers, you might think, well, you've got two strong lawyers on each side. This is really going to be a tough case. But those are the easiest kind of cases to try because they are well prepared, they know the law, and, uh, and you're not taken down a rabbit track and make some stupid you, decision. You're not left on your own to find the law or to ferret out the facts because the lawyers haven't done it. Right. Do you, do you think that uh, it's difficult for most lawyers to transition to a judicial position, or have you found, found has your experience been that it's pretty easy for them to do so? I, I would say the hardest part of the transition is, is the kind of loneliness of the job simply because you, you do not go out necessarily and have lunch with the same people you were before. But I, I didn't find it that lonely because I had good judges around me. But I think judges, particularly in the rural part of the state where they're really just out there on their own, they're the only judge in the courthouse that day, I think it's, it's, it's more of a lonely existence. When we're uh, here in this Supreme Court building, uh, uh, Al Birch and I are the only two on our court that have our main offices here. And, uh, and so you really don't see the volume of people that you do at the Davidson County Courthouse or uh, as a lawyer. I think part of the fun of being a lawyer is associating with fellow lawyers. And you try to, you don't remove yourself. I try to go to every bar event there is, but you just don't, you're not buddy-buddy with the lawyers as, as you were. Were you active in the community before you became a judge? Pretty much so, yes. I, I had been uh, chair of the uh, local Red Cross chapter here and, uh, and had been very active in the church and, and it was active in Rotary before I became a judge. And so... Uh, you know, I think I even became more involved after I became a judge because various civic organizations tended to want a judge on their board. And so you had the opportunity to, uh, to serve even more. I think judges need to limit themselves, but we've got just a lot of judges who do wonderful work. I mean, Bill Koch on the Court of, uh, of Appeals was head of the United Way of Middle Tennessee last year. I don't know how he has the time to do something like that, knowing how demanding that job is. But that's just an example. And they're judge after judge after judge that involve themselves in the community and with their church. And Seems like when I clerked for you in 80, you were a president or some officer in Rotary that year. Right. I, 80, 80 was a busy year because I was, I was heading up Rotary and uh, was still involved with the, with the Red Cross. And, uh, well, getting, you mentioned loneliness. I guess that's one way that a judge can can deal with that and, and do you find that being active in the community makes you a better judge? Definitely, no question about it. Why? Well, number one, you, I mean it's kind of like running for elections. You see part of the community you would never see and, and if you get with organizations like the Red Cross or the Y where there's so, there civic organizations helping a broad band of citizens, uh, I, th I think it just gives you a better feeling and a better knowledge of the community in which you live. I mean, everybody talks about judges being in the ivory tower, and there's some truth to that. And I think that's one of the things that the present Supreme Court has tried to do is get out of the ivory tower. And, uh, you know, I think Riley Anderson, when he came up with the idea of the Scales Project back in 95, is one of the best things that we've been able to do, the scales standing for Supreme Court Education of Students. Uh, uh, I think and, and in pursuant to that program, the court goes and holds court in the schools or has the school children come, come to, to the court. Basically, we usually hold, hold court in, in rural courthouses, and it's the first time the court's ever been, say, to the Shelbyville Courthouse or the Murfreesboro Courthouse or or the Giles County Courthouse. Uh, we were in Giles County not too long ago, and it was a great experience for us, but not only a great experience for the school children, but all those that were involved in the program. Uh, the administrative office of the court goes to a great deal of work and effort to teach the students ahead of time what the cases are about, what the system is about, 
therefore when they come in, uh, they know what to expect and, and, and they ask some great questions. They have a debriefing where the students get to ask, not the judges, but the lawyers that argued the case. And I'm often told by the lawyers that the students uh, ask better questions than the judges did. Well now, I think I know that you had at least part-time law clerks as a chancellor. Right. Is that right? Sure did. And Ray, so Ray Busey and Malcolm McCune were the, our first, uh, they split a, Ben Cantrell and I were able to find a court officer's position and we split that so they clerked for both Ben and myself and they were at Vandy Law School and you know Judge Goddard up until his death he hired UT students while they were still students to be his law clerks and, uh, and that worked out very well for ourselves. When, when I got on the Court of Appeals in, in, in 74 Todd and Shriver did not have law clerks so I went for the first three or four years without a law clerk, not realizing that there was funding for law clerks. And how, how did you get on the Court of Appeals? Uh, it, it was by an appointment by Winfield Dunn, and uh, it, it was a similar process where you went before a selection committee, and they sent three names to the governor. And the three names they sent to Winfield Dunn were three Democrats, so I thought I had a a, a decent shot at it, you know, at that point in time. <laughs> well, now you said that they sent three names. The Selection Commission. Of the Bar Association? No, I, th I think it was a statutory commission that... Would this be the predecessor to the old Appellate Court it, Nominating right, Commission? it certainly was. Mm -hmm. And so uh, could, could the governor have rejected those three names and asked for three more, or was he pretty much stuck with them? I think he thought he was stuck with them. Uh, and because of course, the he was elected with a fair amount of Democratic support, support in Tennessee. But there were, his campaign manager from, from Shelbyville, uh, from Bedford County, and his campaign manager from Rutherford County, who were both outstanding lawyers, had also applied. And the thought was, if either one of those were in the three, they would be. But they were good lawyers, and also were were strong supporters of Governor Dunn. Mm -hmm. But when uh, that did not occur, then you know I had a, a decent shot at it. Mm -hmm. What were your mo what was your motivation for moving from Chancery to the Court of Appeals? Because my wife said that if. Uh, if I didn't change, she wanted me to change jobs. It, it, after about four years of really working six and a half days a week and never getting to see the children because I would come home at night, you know, they would always have been in bed. And she just said, you know, life is too short to not to get, to, because like I said, Frank was a couple of months old. So his first four years, I really never got to see much of him. And Helen from age two to age six, didn't get to see much of her. So she basically put down the law and said it's time for a change. And at about the same time, the position on the Court of Appeals opened up. Now that may seem strange that you're gonna move to a, to a, uh, a higher court, but the truth of the matter is the workload was, was less. And, uh, and so it just worked out beautifully for- So as usual, Claire was right. Claire, oh yes, <laughs> you don't need to bring that up. <laughs> So uh, had you not gone on the Court of Appeals, do you think you might have gone back into private practice? I, I don't know. I mean, we were, we were di struggling with that issue because things hadn't eased up in, in Chancery Court and they didn't ease up for, and like I said, it was either 76 or 78. So they were, I, you know, poor Ben Cantrell went, went through it and, uh, and my hat's always off to Ben Cantrell. Uh, ben, had he applied for that same seat, uh, I think the commission, committee would have probably selected him uh, as one of the three. And, and he had been the Davidson County uh, chairman for, he and Kip Gaden for Winfield Dunn when Winfield was first elected. And that's how both Kip and Ben got their appointment to the, the trial bench. And Ben certainly would have gotten, I feel like, an appointment. But this was in 1974 in Stan Sitakane the guy that ran against me in 72 and was so bad was running against Ben, but he was the Democratic nominee. And a Republican had never won in Davidson County up to that time. And the bar was solidly behind him, Ben Cantrell, 
both Banner and Tennessean were solidly behind Ben Cantrell. So Ben felt like he could beat Sidicane, but if he had taken the Court of Appeals job, Sidicane would have been the next chancellor. And Ben just made the decision, I can't do this to the bench and bar of this state, which I really thought was incredible. And, and uh, That's a story that needs to be told more often to, to more people because yeah. I don't think it's one that many lawyers outside of, of Davidson County anyway. Yeah. I'm not sure understand. Davidson even really realizes it. Mm -hmm. Well, so you, you go on, the, well, first of all, who was instrumental in, in, in arguing your appointment to Governor Dunn? Ben? <laughs> no, really, it was, it was interesting when I, uh, Frank Gorell had always been my mentor, and he helped me get on the chancery bench. And I applied for the Court of Appeals because Claire wanted me to, and without even talking to my mentor. And when Gorell found out that I had applied to the Court of Appeals, he said, that's the dumbest thing you've ever done in that you're a Democrat and Winfield Dunn is not going to appoint a Democrat. And he, you know, he, he just said the opportunity, it was an out-of-county seat. Judge Prier from Gallatin had retired, and, and you already had Shriver and Todd from Middle Tennessee, from Nashville, and he said there's no way a judge from Nashville is going to get this seat. They'd make all three from Nashville. Why don't you wait? Shriver was in his 80s, late 80s at that time. He said, wait, Shriver was, is the chancellor from Davidson County. You should wait. Well, I'd already applied. And uh, so he said, well, you need to be one of the three. And so I guess he was my, quote, campaign manager to help me become one of the three. Once I was one of the three, he said, I can be zero help to you with, with Winfield Dunn and said, do you think Dr. Frist knows Winfield Dunn? Well, of course, he was Winfield's doctor. So Dr. Frist and I chatted and he recommended I talk to uh, Jack Massey. And Jack Massey was a strong Republican at that time. And so I think Jack Massey and Dr. Frist probably were very instrumental in, uh, in helping me get the appointment. What was the most instrumental is the fact that all the three names that went were all Democratic. I think he thought you had to appoint one, and uh, and I had probably had more more civil uh, judicial experience than the others. Did did you find that moving from being a chancellor to now onto a court where you got several judges was a big change? Major change because. On the chancery bench, you made the decision, and that was your decision, and you didn't have to confer with anybody else. Did you write many opinions on the chancery bench? Wrote a lot of opinions. I mean, because at the beginning, that was all you, you had. That's the way you did it, through opinion. <clears throat> and then in the major lawsuits, I, I felt like an opinion was necessary. I wanted an opinion so the intermediate courts knew where I was coming from. <coughs> Excuse me. We had, you know, some judges that would just say, I rule for the plaintiff or I rule for the defendant and wouldn't give the basis. And they said, you know, if I say too much, that gives the intermediate court the opportunity to reverse me. If I just say, I find this way or I find that way, you don't give them any ammunition. But, uh, and that was some advice that both uh, Chancellor Lentz and, and Alf Adams gave me. But I really felt like that I, and I wanted to explain where I was coming from on, on certain cases. So I'd, I'd had a good bit of experience. So that wasn't the real change. The real change was, was working as a three-member court. And also, both of these men were old enough to be my grandfather. I mean, I'm still, I'm, uh, I'm 36 at the time, and Judge Shriver's in his 80s, late, mid to late 80s, and I'm not sure what Judge Todd was, but probably I'm not sure what age he was. But uh, once again, that's what's so great about the judiciary. They accepted this young guy and, uh, and brought me in, and, uh, and we really worked extremely well together. They both taught uh, Sunday school classes, so every Monday you would have a, a session and discuss what your lesson was. I bet a lot of people thought we were in there discussing uh, <laughs> cases and we were discussing their Sunday school lessons. But well, that's where uh, they, being a preacher's kid came in handy. Yeah, they, but they were both fine, fine gentlemen and both had, you know, great reputations and uh, 
so I was very fortunate. Judge Shriver was a real a stickler. I mean, I get kidded because even in retirement, I won't come downtown without a coat and tie on just because you're coming downtown. But Judge Shriver wore his shirt and tie even to mow grass. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what uh, old time uh, he was. But uh, they, they were great friends and, and good mentors once again. I, I, I was truly blessed. And when you say Dr. Frist, are we talking about the senior at that the point. father of your good friend, longtime friend Tommy Frist? Yeah. Okay. Dr. Frist and Senior was was the governor. He had been for some reason just became kind of the doctor to the governors. I mean, he had been uh, Clements. I mean, doctor. He had been uh, Ellington's doctor, and uh, and he was Winfield's doctor. And I, I, as long as he was practicing medicine, I guess he was. He was and, in a good clinic. And, and did Claire all. like the appellate bench better? She loved the appellate bench. She really did. Good. Now, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I think everybody realizes that the hardest working court is the trial bench. And, and boy, my hat's off to the trial judges of this state. And we've got, we really have excellent trial judges. When I went on the court, it was really an older court. I mean, you look at the pictures of the Davidson County judges when we were I think there were 13 of us, and you look at that photograph, and Ben Cantrell and I stuck out like a sore thumb. But it was at about that time when the governor started appointing younger people. I mean, Sissy Daughtry uh, was appointed in 75. And uh, so we, we, you just had, Jerry Scott was appointed in about 76. So you just had a younger judiciary, and it's continuing on. Uh, even though I've reached now the point where I'm one of the older people in it, you still, the governors are appointing younger people, and I think it's just tremendous because they do a great job. Well, you were just barely old enough to be constitutionally eligible, correct? Right. So, were you when you? How old were you when you took the Court of Appeals bench? Thirty-five. Thirty-five, thirty-six, and then on the Supreme Court, forty-one, forty-two. Were you the youngest Court of Appeals judge when you took the bench as well? Yeah, I think so. All right, and. How long did, were you on the Court of Appeals? I was on there for six years. So I had four years on the Chancery bench and six on, on the Court of Appeals. So when I ran for the Supreme Court, you know, part of what I was running on is I had 10 years of judicial experience and some of that on an intermediate court. And, and, and when, you, excuse me, what, when you were on the Court of Appeals, were there cases that stood out that were most significant? We had, uh, we had a whole lot more domestic relations cases than, than I had when I was on the Chancery bench. What was interesting, the fact that I came from a civil defense law firm, my four years on the Davis County Chancery bench, I never heard a workers' comp case because lawyers could, there were just two courts, so you went in with your complaint and you could file it, you could look at the number, Odd went to, to Lentz, even went to myself, and in four years I never had a workers' comp because I guess plaintiff's lawyers didn't have any confidence in me that I could handle a workers' comp case. But, you know, when I got on the Supreme Court, that's all, that was a major part of our workload. And so, uh, uh, but, but on, the, on the intermediate court, I would say, you know, the, the most interesting things that we dealt with, Sam Lewis came on, they increased the court to a 12-member court, either in 76 or 78. Paul Summers took it in, in West Tennessee. Sam Lewis was the one in, in uh, Middle, and I think Herschel Franks, Herschel was definitely the one from, uh, from East Tennessee. And so Sam and I were closer to the same age, and uh, we felt like comparative fault uh, was something that the Supreme Court should consider. And the only judge in the state of Tennessee that would ever charge comparative fault, because you really shouldn't charge it, uh, was Jim Swigert. And Swigert, though, had enjoyed about once a year, or once every other year, charging comparative fault, and so that case would come up. And obviously, we'd, we would have to say he was wrong in doing it, but then we would write a concurrence saying, but this is something that the Supreme Court really should look at because we favor some form of comparative fault. And the Supreme Court never granted 
any of those cases, and it wasn't until 1980 when I got on that court that I realized why. Did you know that I reviewed one of them as a law clerk for the court, the one you wrote in 1980, that went to conference while Judge Brown was still on the Supreme Court? No, I didn't realize that. One of, I don't remember the name of that case, but one of those cases uh, went to conference just before you took office in 1980. And, um, and it was I, denied. <laughs> and I will tell you though, you, you, you know, you had you had a little support, but you didn't have enough. <laughs> well, when I got on the court, I realized I had the support of one person. <laughs> well, back then, well, no, you were there with George Brown. I'm sure Joe Henry was probably for some form of it, and Ray Brock was when I got on the court, but there were three votes that were definitely opposed to it. Maybe this is a good time to talk about it, the evolving law and uh, and how do you sort of weigh the decision to um, change the common law, especially when the legislature's had an opportunity to change it and, and has not changed it? Well, I, you know, truthfully, a comparative fault is probably stands out as much as any case simply because Trial Lawyers Association had tried to get some legislation passed and were unsuccessful. Uh, the issue had been before the Supreme Court uh, from, from 1974 up until 1980. They had at least three or four cases that I'm aware of in which they denied cert, just didn't even want to take it. And, uh, so, and, and all through the 80s when I was on the S Supreme Court, like I said, I found out why they weren't granting it because Ray Brock and myself were the only ones that thought some form of comparative fault would be good. The other three were pretty solidly entrenched, and you don't want to grant a Rule 11 application for permission to appeal in a case if, if the decision is going to be three to two and you're going to decide it the same way. And uh, because it gets the antennas up of the bench and the bar, well, the Supreme Court has granted this, they're going to do something. And we knew quite well that we weren't, even though. Ray and I had two votes, and under our rules, it only took two votes to grant. We never granted one throughout the 80s, simply because to do so would have wasted the lawyer's time and, and raised false hopes. Judge, we'll, we'll talk some more about that after our next break. All right, Judge, you serve on the Court of Appeals then until 1980, is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. And by now, has your family grown? My family is growing, and by 1980, when I was running for the Supreme Court, uh, my children were very involved in tennis, and my son, Frank, who was uh, 10 years old at the time, won the state 10-year-old division. And as he calls it, he peaked at age 10 because uh, he, he, he beat the person that, is, that, that continued to beat him later on in life. And my daughter won the uh, state 12. So it was a big summer for us for your two children to win the state titles in tennis. Mm -hmm. Helen went on to, uh, to Florida to uh, play in the Southerns. And uh, uh, Claire and I really weren't able to go with her because we were involved in the campaign. So. Cecil Croson took uh, Helen down to, uh, to Florida, and she uh, didn't win a match because they had such great food and such fun time Obvi together. Obviously, your judgment is not infallible. Well, that was Claire's <laughs> idea. <laughs> now, but, uh, as we sit here in 2006, you've got grandchildren. Right. Helen is now 38 and has three children, uh, Rylan, who's a teenager, 13, and Casey, who's 10, and Clay, who's seven, and my son is an ophthalmologist in, in uh, Murfreesboro now and uh, has uh, two children, uh, Russell, age three, and little Rose, uh, age about one and a half. So uh, we've got, th that was one of my real reasons to retire is to get to spend more time with grandchildren because as I mentioned earlier in the interview, I really didn't get to know Frank that well, ages one through four, and I missed a lot. And 
So I'm make, taking advantage of retirement. And little known fact, uh, Frank uh, signed a contract including a covenant not to compete with his Murfreesboro Medical Group and that's why you did not participate in Murfreesboro Medical Group v. Udom, is that right? That's right, and you were his lawyer when he signed that uh, contract. Because I knew it was gonna happen and it wasn't <laughs> gonna be enforceable anyway. <laughs> Now, was it your grandchildren that gave you the nickname Judgy Poo? I guess so. Actually, it was some friends, but they're not real close friends anymore. <laughs> <laughs> now, what I hear is that the name Judgy Poo came from some of your late acquired taste in gambling. Well, the, the, the person that was telling you this was uh, one of the fun things with, with my son, once I got on the intermediate court and on the Supreme Court and you've got more time was... Uh, uh, doing father-son trips, and we did one down the Grand Canyon, but had to stop in Las Vegas, and that's where Judgy Pooh came in. And I understand from Mr. Friss that uh, a dealer in Las Vegas gave you that moniker. Apparently so. It's funny how certain people remember things and others try to forget. Well, I think Tommy's made it his, uh, his purpose in life to make sure no one forgets. I think so, and he got it into this so interview. So we've recorded it now for posterity. <laughs> now, um, you went on the Supreme Court um, through the process of being nominated by the State Democratic Executive Committee. Right. Is that correct? And that, uh, that process, in that process, you had one vacancy created by the death of Justice Henry, mm -hmm. and you, uh, you competed for the nomination from the State Executive Committee, and then that's, that's what triggered the election between you and Justice George Brown, who had been appointed by Lamar Alexander. Right. All right. And I tell you, the uh, executive committee, that was a tough decision for you because three of the people that applied for the seat, myself being one, the other two, Sissy Daughtry and Al Birch, eventually uh, became members of the court. So it was, a, it was a tough decision. I felt honored. All right. So now you've gone from a three-judge court to a five-judge court. And, and how to explain to us how that affects things and how the tenure of a court serving together can impact the way the court approaches its decision making. Well, you know, I always d describe it as the 74 court because that's when uh, Joe Henry and the rest, the other four were together in 74. But I, I also use it in terms of the 80 court because that's when I came on board. But you already had four members of that court who had served together from 74 to 80. So they had been together for six years. I joined this court, and it's interesting. We, from 80 until 90, we were five white males. Three of us went to Vanderbilt Law School. Two were in the same, had the same teachers because they were there at the same time at Vanderbilt Law School. And you tend to think alike. And, uh, so, so that court was truly the hardest working court I served on simply because of the jurisdiction that that court had. But it was, you, you certainly can't say that it was a very diverse court. And then in 90, you have your first woman in Sissy Daughtry. And then in 93, you have your first African American in Al Birch, first African American elected to the court in Al Birch. Uh, and during that period from 90 until 98, those eight years, in other words, I've already said for 10 years, we only had six judges. And, but the next eight years, we had nine different judges. So there's a great deal of turnover, but a great deal of diversity. And then from 98 until when I retired in 2005, for a period of seven years, we only had the same five members that were elected uh, at the, in the judicial elections of uh, 98. You, you've served twice as Chief Justice, two separate terms, is that right? Or two I, separate periods, I should two say? Two separate periods, right. And, and did that, was that the selection of the Chief Justice impacted by this, this the different dynamic on the court in terms of its personnel? Well, the 74 court really couldn't, all, all five members that were new to the court, so that was an interesting phenomenon. And I think most of them wanted to be chief, and so rather than go on seniority, which was still questionable on how you determine seniority, they decided to split it up 19 months for each judge. So from, from 74 until 90, 
you, you automatically rotated into it and uh, for a period of, of 19 months. So from January of 98, uh, no, January of 89, excuse me, until September of uh, 90, I served as chief. Uh, and then we had a new court. And basically, Brian, Charlie O'Brien were the only holdovers, and you have three new members. Charlie O'Brien and yourself? And myself were the only holdovers. And so the 90 court had three new members, and they ran, truthfully, against some incumbent judges. In other words, Sissy Daughtry ran against uh, Judge Harbison, and Riley Anderson ran against uh, Bob Cooper and uh, in the state executive committee. And... So it was kind of the old court versus a new court. And so the thought was, which I agreed, that uh, it would probably be good to have a new, fresh chief justice from this new group that came on. And Lyle Reed was selected. And so Lyle was selected and served for four years. And during that four years, I thought, was just an excellent chief in that in 93, we got the Tennessee plan which would not have happened if it weren't for Lyle and, and John Wilder. And in 93, we also got the jurisdiction change where we became a pure Rule 11 court. And uh, a a pure permissive appeal. Permissive uh, appeal court. All your jurisdiction be based on applications for and, permission and to And that appeal. one thing had more to do with the changing of the Supreme Court than I think any one thing because 50% of our workload prior to that time were hearing workers' comp cases. And even the death penalty cases, even though we still hear each death penalty case, they now, as of 93, went through the intermediate court. So I think 93 was, was a major change in how the court functioned and operated because of, of jurisdiction. But yet, isn't it true that, that if you, for example, look at the period 93 to, to 2005, you still see a lower and lower percentage of applications being accepted for permission to appeal? Perhaps so, but uh, the truth of the matter, I think in the years 80 to 90 that I served, uh, we were all aware of, of the heavy workload that the court had. We would go to Knoxville, and we would have th three of the five days would be workers' comp. And, and I can recall one time even going over to a Saturday uh, to hear some cases, and and that you're absolutely right, that's not true now. Now the court will go to Knoxville two and a half to three days. But the types of cases they're hearing, I think, are more suited for a Supreme Court. Uh, court more, still, still yeah. hears workers' comp cases. I mean, they will still grant and, and hear a workers' comp case, but, but 50 to 60 percent of the docket isn't workers' comp. It's more truly a law development court and not an error correction court. Very much so. And, and is it fair to say, though, that as, it, as the Supreme Court has evolved, the Court of Appeals has become more significant in terms of the finality of their decisions and the significance of especially their published opinions? Much more. I would say 90% of their opinions are, are end up the way they have uh, drafted them. I mean, we deny them. I think we probably take just about 10 to 15%. And if I remember correctly, the, the, you talked about it being a new court in 1990. And in fact, I think your campaign slogan was, or you called yourself, the court of the 90s. Is that right? Is that right? right. And, and it wasn't long after that court was elected in 1990 that the court had the chance again to wrestle with the issue of comparative fault. That's right. And that's the issue that you had written about during the 70s and as late as 1980. You now had a change in personnel on the court, and another 12 years had passed without the legislature addressing comparative fault. I know you've called comparative fault, the decision in McIntyre, um, the most significant decision that you think you were involved in. Can you tell us, tell us what you feel comfortable telling us about how that evolved and, and how comparative fault got adopted and what sorts of issues you were wrestling with? Well, it, it's interesting in that uh, in 80, as it, when I came on, it was quite clear that Ray Brock and I were the only two that were interested in even discussing it. And, and, and the other three, Harbison, Cooper, and Phones, had, had good logic and reasons why they didn't want to deal with it, the legislature being one. It was an issue for the legislature to deal with. 
So when 90 comes along, uh, I had no idea where these others stood, and it was, we campaigned that year, and we're in the same van, but we never discussed issues like that. I guess we were just discussing the campaign. I had no idea where, where Lyle Reed, Sissy Daughtry, and Riley Anderson were. I knew that Charlie O'Brien, when he took Ray Brock's seat on the court in 87, he was totally opposed to it, so it went from a, a three to two to a four to one, my being the only member of the court that was still in favor of, of discussing it. So when, when the 90 elections, I had no idea, and the first time it comes up, uh, there are four people that say, I think we ought to discuss it. I think we ought to take this case. And uh, part of the discussion was, well, we don't want to take this case unless we're going to do something. And, and let's give credence to the arguments in, in the briefs that said it's for the legislature to act. And we were quite aware that the legislature had not acted. And they had had the opportunity to act. So that major hurdle, which was a major hurdle, was discussed really before we granted it. But once we granted it, uh, then we knew in our hearts some form of comparative fault we would have. We knew that Charlie was totally opposed to it, so we thought it would be a four to one decision. We then get after oral argument, and, and what we did not know is that we were so spread out on what type of comparative fault. The pure form of comparative fault was supported by several members of the court. Lyle Reed was at, was at the 49.50 percent. Charlie O'Brien was still for no form of comparative fault. So for the first time, it really showed me, well, I shouldn't say for the first time. We dealt with some of these type of issues uh, in the court of the 80s. But, but it truly showed me that if we were going to make a major change in the law, we needed to at least be a four to one court. And we knew where the one was. So it meant that the four of us had to reach some type of agreement because you do not want to make a major change in the law in a three to two decision when, as I indicated, you're having major people leaving the court uh, throughout that period of time. Uh, Sissy left and Al Birch took uh, his place and then you had uh, Penny White came on board and took Charlie O'Brien's place and then Janice Holder took Penny's place. And, 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 and it went on and on until Mickey Barker took, took Lyle's place. So you kind of had a fruit basket turnover on the court. So for the decision to have any real meaning for the bench and bar, it needed to be four to one. So for the first time, I saw what real compromise was. I mean, I saw people going from pure 100% comparative fault all the way down to the mid-range. And, uh, and, and not feeling good about it, but feeling like this is necessary. And uh, so the court ended up where, where we ended up uh, on McIntyre decision. And finally, after Charlie O'Brien sits in and listens to almost a year's worth of discussion, he finally was sold on it. To our shock and surprise, Charles said, I can agree with you on that. So and, it was a 5-0 opinion which sent out a very strong message to the bench and bar. And in that opinion, you also abolished most forms of joint and several liability. Had that been part of the discussion oh, all very, along? Oh, very much part of the discussion. That was part of the give and, give and take. And, uh, and since that time, I have seen other important cases reach the court where if, if we end up, if the court ends up with a 3-2 decision, it really means in a way that they just got worn out and tired of discussing it and just couldn't, the give and take. I mean, people were locked in. Because we always shoot at least a 4-1 or a 5-0. So a 3-2 decision is not a good decision. We're not proud of the 3-2 decisions because it's not a strong decision. And of course, but, what you have is lawyers preserving that same issue in the trial and appellate courts, thinking that the change of one judge might yeah. change. Well, as you mentioned yeah. earlier, the sentencing issue, that was a three to two opinion. We would have, that was an important case. And we would have loved to have had that four to one, but it, it, uh, it was never gonna be. Once the three two decision comes down, yes. and then the issue comes back up a few, le a few years later, does that then make it more difficult because now you've got the principle of stereo decisis involved 
and you've got to think in terms of, well, are we comfortable from the standpoint of, of the court's credibility and changing a rule that we've just adopted? And, and to what extent does that come into play as you weigh how you'd like to rule in a case versus the context of the precedents that's sitting there already? Right, that's, that's an excellent question. And that comes up so, so much. And, and you will find judges that will write a dissent and, and, and it'll be a sole dissent, maybe it's four to one. And the majority, the, the same issue comes up again, and, and, and they continue to dissent. But they realize full well that the majority is the majority and that the court has spoken on that issue. And I think if the makeup of the court were to change, even that person who dissented would probably say under stare decisis, you know, even though I didn't agree with them, it is the decision of the court, and under stare decisis and wanting to have uniformity, that they would probably go along with that. In fact, I have seen that, that occur. So it, it really takes, uh, for, for a court to totally change its decision in a three-year span, really make means basically that the court felt like they were in error first go-round. The decision to adopt comparative fault, as you know, um, has been criticized by some in the legislature and even some judges and lawyers uh, on the basis of separation of powers, the argument that there are some things that should be left to the legislature and, and the adoption of the type of fault should have been left to the legislature. On the other side of the spectrum, though, we've seen examples uh, during your term as Chief Justice of issues that the legislature has waded into, like the criminal rules of evidence or interlocutory appeals in class actions, ex issues like that where the legislature has moved over into areas that have traditionally been part of a core function of the judicial branch. How does the court decide when it's going to go along with a pronouncement of the legislature and when it's going to assert itself and its appropriate role um, as, as the decider of issues um, such as those? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. You know, I, I'm, I'm just speaking for Frank Drewota and not speaking for the court, obviously, on this. But, but you know, comparative fault is, is, once again, a good example in that uh, the legislature had not acted, even though legislation had been brought before them to act. And, 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 and I think, and like I said, Bill Harbison and Bob Cooper had an excellent argument that it was for the legislature. And truth of the matter is, had the legislature acted and had they had a commission to study it and had they had gotten all the special interest groups together, now whether they could have come up with anything or not, I don't know, but it was always our feeling. You, you recall McIntyre was just a two-car accident and we couldn't address nearly all of the issues that needed to be addressed. And it took probably five or six years before we really were able to reach all the issues. So I'm the first to say it would have been better for the legislature to have dealt with that issue because had they dealt with it, they could have dealt with the broad aspect of the entire thing. So I guess I'm here really, you know, preaching out of both sides of my mouth because hindsight had the legislature done it, but the legislature did not do it and they did not do it for a period uh, of probably about 15 years. And so uh, a majority of the court at that th time just felt, well, it's time to act. So you might not disagree that a comprehensive statutory approach was better, but no. at the same time, when the legislature does not act. Act, and, I, and we really didn't see it happening. And so, and, and we really were convinced, we were, there were only five states left that had not adopted comparative fault. And so we just really felt the time had come. and. You know, the truth of the matter is, I think both plaintiffs and defense bar are probably okay with comparative fault now after it's worked for so long. I really, as a, as a trial judge and as a, as a defense litigator, uh, I hated really to see senior partners in my law firm go in before a jury and say, if this plaintiff was the least degree at fault, give a big, and they would put a big zero on the chalkboard. And I would see in a rear end accident, juries coming back with a, a zero for the defendant. And that truly wasn't justice. 
I'm afraid the clock on the wall is going to catch up with us, so I want to hit just a few uh, topics before we, we run out of time. Um, are there other decisions that come to mind as, as important decisions in your career as a Supreme Court judge? Well, you know, the, 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 the typical answer is every decision is an important decision because uh -huh. they are. I mean, by the time they get to the court, the, the litigants, that's the most important case for them. I guess really cases dealing with domestic relations to some degree, those are very difficult cases when you're dealing with child custody. And Sissy Daughtry uh, brought a, a new view uh, to the court, uh, being a woman, and, and, and followed by Penny White and, and, uh, and, and Janice Holder. So I guess, I guess the diversity that I saw in the later years on the court, uh, particularly from 98 until I retired seven years later, uh, it, it was the most diverse court I think we've had in the state, but not diversity based upon gender or race, but a diversity of ideas because we all five graduated from different law schools in different parts of the country. And uh, we, we just didn't think alike. And, uh, and that's good. And I think lawyers would be pleased to hear that the five member Supreme Court doesn't think alike. Uh, so we had many contested issues, but the one thing that the court did have was mutual respect one for the other. And I think, you know, mutual respect for your fellow judges is a necessary ingredient for any appellate court to function properly. And we've had that, and I think we continue to have that. We've seen some decisions recently that are based upon the state constitution. Um, such as the National Planned Parenthood case in the area, area of privacy rights. Do you think as we see the United States Supreme Court uh, changing direction, we'll see to the Tennessee Supreme Court and other state Supreme Courts playing a more major role in the fundamental constitutional issues of the day under their each state's constitutions? I think so. And I think, you know, we, we first saw it in, in the criminal arena when Bob Cooper wrote his opinion. And I mean, that was, we're talking about, you know, the mid 80s on that, but it has even gotten more so when we go to these judicial conferences and particularly chief justices conferences where you have the opportunity to visit with judges from throughout the country and find out what they're doing. And I mean, we literally have had seminars at chief justices conference on needing to use your state constitution. And, and you've got certain states that use it more than others, like Oregon perhaps, but in Massachusetts and others, but uh, it, it is helpful for judges to be with other judges from other states, find out what they're doing. And Tennessee truly is, is on the cutting edge. And it's kind of fun to see that a southern state is not in, in the background or on the back burner. Uh, and, uh, and I think the, the present makeup of the court uh, is exciting. Now, what is going to be exciting in the future is you're going to have a major change on the Tennessee Supreme Court come August 31 with two new members. So you will have had, with my retirement less than a year ago and the two new, you're going to have three new judges within the period of one year. And so those that love to study courts are going to love to study uh, the court of uh, September of 06 through uh, 2014 because, uh, you know, they will have had major change in the makeup of the court, but you're also going to see great continuity because hopefully the five people that are on there in 06 will remain on there for an extended period of time because they're young and you've already got two women. We could have a, a, a third woman or you could have uh, another minority, African American. The, the, this governor has some interesting questions to, to deal with, but the important thing, and I think he will do it, is a point based on merit and good legal scholars, and I think it's uh, going to be a, an important time for the state. How would you like to have your career um, as a Supreme Court judge remembered? Mm, tough question. I guess just remembered as being a, a fair judge, an honest judge, uh, a hard-working judge. Uh, 
you know, the, the, the courts are, are really open now uh, under the leadership of when Riley was chief. I mean, you know, cameras in the courtrooms and being more accessible. Uh, and, and, and I have, have built on to liking the programs that he started, like the Scales Project, which is being more accessible, uh, swearing in attorneys across the state, which we did not do in, in the 80s. Uh, I think is very important so that families can see their loved ones sworn in to a very important role instead of everybody coming to Nashville. Uh, so I've seen a lot of positives and uh, I, I guess I'd, I'd like for Frank DeWo to just remember as a, uh, one of the ones on, on a really good Supreme Court, which I think we have, uh, who worked hard and did his best and was, was fair and gave everybody a level playing field. As we look over the horizon, of course we know you're gonna to live to be and, at least 101. <laughs> um, you're gonna uh, spend more time with your grandchildren. You're gonna do more traveling. Tell me about this group, Six Fast Feet. Six Fast Feet, they're not very fast anymore. They've kind of slowed down. They've even taken to the bicycles, you know. Uh, you've obviously been talking to some friends of ours, but you know, I, I think, Family and friends and church and the law, these are all part of your life. And friends have been a major part of my life. And we've had groups that used to get together at Percy Warner Park, which is a park with a lot of hills here in, in Davidson County. And, and we used to run for hours on Saturday mornings, but we don't do that anymore. So we're into uh, biking and traveling together. So uh, And that's Tommy Frist and Steve. And Steve Riven and... I name Alan Bryan and Dave Malone. They're just a large group of us that uh, really enjoy being together. I guess Tommy is my closest friend. He and Steve, just because Tommy and I have gone back to the fifth grade, you know. And uh, uh, you know what they say about see, old friends, they know where you are and they know where you've been. That's right. That's right. But you've also accepted you're, you're president-elect of the YMCA, CA of Middle Tennessee. And, so, and I've, I've found out that 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 that's a large organization. They've got a about a $74 million budget and 30 some odd chapters uh, facilities around uh, Middle Tennessee. So it's something I'm very excited about and will be time consuming. Chief Justice Frank Drewota, this has been a privilege for me to spend this time with you. I could have gone until midnight tonight. We could have <laughs> talked uh, legal philosophy and politics for another seven hours, but we're grateful to you for the time you spent and we know that all of your friends and family and lawyer friends and judge friends and, and historians in the state of Tennessee will be, uh, be greatly benefited from, from you giving us the history of your, not only your life, but uh, your, your wonderful years of public service to the Tennessee judiciary. Thank you, Buck, and thank Melinda. Thank you for being here.